ready? Yes. Okay. Okay. Are you ready for us? We're good. Okay. Uh, hello, and welcome to the Thursday, November 30th regular um, meeting of the school committee. I will ask you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we have a busy night ahead of us. I will read through the agenda, and then we're going to make one um, one logistical change, and we will get right to work. So we will start with recognitions. We then have our first opportunity for public comment. However, um, I've taken a little poll in the audience, and I think we're going to ask the superintendent to give her report first because it will be on the bus transportation policy, which I know a lot of you are here to listen to and comment on. So thought it might be more helpful to you if you heard the update before you um, weighed in. Uh, so we'll do the superintendent's report, then we will have public comment, then we'll move right into our regular report. So we'll have our student council report. We'll start our budget work. We have, tonight we're hearing um, from the curriculum department, the high school, and the middle school. Following that, we'll have our regular liaison reports. We'll have the school committee chair report. Um, and then we will move, we have no new business tonight, we'll move directly into old business, where we will take up policy EEA, transportation, for a second reading. Following that, we will um, consider an overnight travel request and discuss a capital budget item revision. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we do have new business. We flip-flopped it so that old business would be earlier for those of you interested in the bus transportation policy. Under new business, our only item is um, taking our first look at the calendar for the 2018-2019 school year. Following that, we have our second opportunity for public comment and items by consensus. And if we have need, we <coughs> do have an executive session. Are we having executive session? We are not. We are not having executive session. So we're hoping to adjourn by 10.50 <laughs> um, and hopefully earlier than that. So. Without further ado, I would like to start off by inviting our Top of the Hill honorees to join us up at the table. Um, come on up. And we have one honoree who, um, this was my fault, I extended the invitation too late and she was not able to make childcare arrangements. Um, so that's my fault, but there is another honoree um, from this year who I know Josh can tell us about. Um, so Josh, is it fair of me to ask you to tell us a little bit about the program and about the honorees this year? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, thank you and, uh, good evening, uh, for a quick synopsis, the top of the hill program began three years ago in conjunction with the Hopkinton education foundation and the Hopkinton parent teacher association. And it was an effort to kind of highlight alumni who have gone on to do impressive things in their particulars. Uh, no matter whether it be uh, in fields of medicine or industry or volunteerism or education. We feel very strongly that a school system is only as good as the folks that it uh, creates a foundation for and allows to grow. And what better way for us as a community and a high school to show our current students where they can go. Uh, you know, from as far back as 1898 with the Brown family and the finding of the Boston Celtics to more recently graduate Sean Terry, who in our first year was uh, recognized for some of the work he's done with the Veterans Association. And so we really try to model for our students what it means to be successful. And that doesn't necessarily correlate with your W-2 or where you went to school or what your job title is, but more importantly, what it is you've done for society. And it's an opportunity for us to honor that great work. So that's kind of the history of the program. Uh, in this particular year, we had a great class that included Sarah Ellum, who, again, wasn't able to make it this evening. She's one of our English uh, SMLs at the high school, leads one of the best English departments in the entire nation statistically, which, frankly, if that was any other industry, there would be a heck of a lot more recognition. But for some reason, education doesn't seem to catch the same cachet as, uh, you know, electronics, etc. So, but for Sarah, she's done amazing work, uh, went on to study at Notre Dame after Hopkinton and has come back and just continued to be an anchor for a very talented English department. 
Uh, and then over here to my far right is Scott Mackin. And for those of you who are who've been in town for a while and, and have been observing all the different great organizations that exist, you know that Scott is an amazing member. Uh, brings inspiration to our students and particularly our student athletes on a regular basis. And uh, David Antaki, who's here working some film, I'm sure behind the scenes, uh, one of our student council members just made the most remarkable uh, video honoring Scotty. Uh, with uh, a number of uh, faculty who uh, both played under Scotty's direction and also now get to work with Scott. So S Scott's just an inspiration to us all here at the high school, and we're so happy to have him as part of our team. Uh, and then to my immediate right, uh, for those of you who don't know, Mike Whalen, graduate of Hopkinton High School in 1968 and a Vietnam vet, and again, uh, has not only been a very successful private business owner, but for anyone who pays attention, they know that Mike is ready and able to assist in all things Hopkinton whenever asked, and oftentimes without even wanting recognition such as this, never mind money. Uh, he was instrumental in the efforts regarding the 300th anniversary and, and creating a time capsule removal from a building that took uh, would cost a typical mason thousands and thousands of dollars and would have been a big project, and Mike just rolled up his sleeves like always and was quick to, um, to help the town. Uh, and not only that, Mike's done amazing work with the Veterans Association. So for those of you who are interested, there's a Facebook page and lots of information regarding the amazing alums that this town has graduated. And it's for the work of your school committee and, and the uh, upper administration that creates a foundation for success that we see every day. And then we get to see generations later. So uh, it's, it's great to, to be a part of that. Thank you. I had the opportunity to go this year to the... Um to the evening and it was so inspiring to hear from all of you and <coughs> about all of you um, what Josh is too humble to say is that the student surprised Josh with honoring him as well um, and inducting him as well into the uh, top of the hill program and Steve Simos gave a hilarious speech um, that if you weren't already a humble guy would have humbled you a little bit even more but uh, it was a great speech so I just thank you so much to you Josh for bringing this program here but also to Scotty and to Mike and to Sarah, just for representing the kind of, you know, of people that we all should aspire to be, the students as well as those of us sitting around the table. It was, it's such, the timing of the event right before Thanksgiving is such a nice lead in, I think, to a, a weekend where we all celebrate what we're thankful for. And just, I'm so thankful <coughs> that you represent Hopkinton in, in the, in our community and beyond. And, and you're just such a great example for the kids. So thank you very much. I know other members got to go to the, to the meeting as well, so I don't want to hog all the time. But Very impressive program, and all four of you, uh, including Sarah, really thank you for, on behalf of the community, and just, wow, a really impressive group. This was actually, uh, schedule-wise, the first time I was actually able to make the event itself. I've always been a fan of the program, but being at the event was so impactful, and I think we were probably halfway through the, the first presentation honoring Scotty when the thought that was rattling through my head is why did I not bring my kids? Yeah. Um, it, it is such an inspiration for, for them and I know there were a lot of students there which was great to see the, these d distinguished alumni of, of uh, you know of Hopkinton and, and what you know what service means and really understand as, as Josh you outlined how we really can define success in ways that may not be as visible to them. So um, again, congratulations on, on being honored, and but more importantly, thank you, all of you, for all that you've done and, um, and all that you've inspired. I, I feel uh, humility and also pride to be part of the same community that uh, has you. And also, um, I think there was a quote that was used in Hef's uh, statement in the program statement, the people we honor. I feel very proud that you're being honored and I'm part of this community. Great, great to have you as part of this. Thank you. And just to, I mean, every, it's already been said, but what I think is so awesome about this, Josh, is, is you created a program. So often we hear about, you know, Hall of Fame and we hear about other things with high school, but this, this is more, this is like character. This isn't athletic ability. This isn't necessarily and nothing from many of you guys. This isn't about like academic. <coughs> this is just character. And so, you guys, this, you are well deserving of this award. Obviously, you've got a lot of folks who've backed you up in so many ways, and, and, and I think that you know, congratulations and thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ready?
why don't we start off with the superintendent's report, and then we'll start at the top with public comment and move along. So, obviously a hard act to follow, <laughs> but always a wonderful way um, to, to start our, our meetings with recognitions. Um, I'm just looking to see, yes, so we're going to do students after this. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you, Jean, for letting me take this out of order. Um, I see that we have um, lots of people here tonight, which is wonderful. I know some people are here for different reasons, um, but we always like to respect everybody's time. And um, with that said, I wanted to comment um, and provide uh, some follow-up to the school committee on, um, there's feedback tonight, on the last meeting, our last meeting where we first took up transportation policy two meetings ago, um, at which point we discussed the importance of um, really having the time to have further, further conversation, um, both with the transportation department and with the daycare providers. And at that time, um, you had asked us to follow up meaning Susan and I, to follow up with the daycare providers. Um, we did that, and we had a really collaborative uh, meeting with them um, where there was great discussion, and, and I believe um, understanding on both sides, which was what was really great about the discussion. You know, it, it improved understanding from our side. We also learned um, that we have something very important in common, and that is the safety of the students. And it was really wonderful to have open conversation about the fact that there are many levels of um, and many sets of eyes and arms looking out for students to make sure that they get to where they need to get to and layers so that if they're if a child is inadvertently put on the wrong bus um, and they get delivered to a daycare um, in some cases um, you know either on the wrong day or whatever um, there's a shared responsibility on the part of the daycare providers to make sure that, that parents are notified, that schools are notified. It's not a matter of simply turning around and putting the kids back on the bus, sending them back to school. And so it was a great conversation. Um, we've also received, and the school committee, I should say, have received um, additional communication from, from people um, across the community. I know that I've read them all. I know that you've read them all. And um, <clears throat> we understand that this is a very complex <coughs> situation. It's not as simple as policy. It's not as simple as budget. And the proposal that is circulating tonight and that we will be taking up later in your meeting um, really is uh, a tribute to the work of, of Susan and the Transportation Debar Department, particularly Marianne Fitzpatrick, um, who has spent a lot of time with Susan really putting together um, schedules that bus schedules bus routes that would allow us to kind of do a could this work scenario and we'll take up policy later on in this meeting but in a nutshell what it does is it allows us to propose an alternate an alternative to the five day a week busing proposal um, that still meets the needs our primary need which was always student safety um, it does not allow us to make a reduction to the budget um, and we'll discuss later um, around recommendations in our own discussion about what the priorities are. Um, but the interesting proposal uh, includes having students ride their home bus every day. So it will result in more buses stopping at daycare centers, but it will provide less confusion for, for children um, and, and more responsibility for drivers who know all of their students anyway. Um, so there's another layer of assistance in terms of being able to make sure that kids get off at the right place on the right day. Um, and they've been able to work this out because our larger daycare centers um, are central <coughs> and most many buses go by them um, with, with some tweaks to schedules and the inclusion of all of the buses, 26, mm -hmm. all 26 buses. Um, we would be able to talk about later in the meeting a proposal that includes having students um, not having a, a designated daycare bus. Um, I wanted to say that up front um, be before public comment so that people know that the comments that you've been hearing, that we've all been hearing, have been heard. Clearly there are things to be worked out procedurally. And the other thing I wanted to mention in my report was the logistics around notes from home. We also had a follow-up meeting with administration. Um, 
I know that we had discussions around some things that could be put in place immediately. Again, daycare providers were wonderful in seeking a solution, a joint solution, um, because we understand the importance of taking, we're all, we're all taking care of the children, the parents, the school, the daycare, we're all working together to support each other in this really important work of raising children. And um, <clears throat> so the idea of finding a solution to the notes from home um, is not a daycare provider problem, but it is a situation that we've started to look at, and it is outside of the, of the policy discussion. It's, it's procedural, and that would be something that we will continue to work on as an administrative level, um, but is not something that should be really bogging us down in terms of making decisions about the policy. The reason we brought this to you to begin with was because it was timely in, in because we're talking budget. And so not only because of budget, because of also because of potential changes to that could affect daycare providers and parents who count on those daycare providers um, is the reason that this all came out several a month ago to begin with. Um, and so I just I guess I want to thank the school committee, I want to thank the community, um, I want to thank the transportation department for everybody really working together to openly discuss uh, a, a real issue that impacts our community and, and to listen to each other um, and to come to what is not yet a solution, but certainly we have um, an additional option for your consideration. So thank you. All right, thank you. Does anybody have questions? I just want to make sure I understood clearly. So the new... Uh, policy proposal that we're going to discuss later is allows for a part-time daycare schedule yes every student is going to just all the buses are going to go so you're just going to always ride your bus it's and whatever all, that's day right. you get off at daycare you get off at daycare that's right or you get off at home you get off at home okay. it actually makes it the other statistic that i forgot to throw out there is that it it because there are children who ride daycare and i should say this it doesn't necessarily mean for only the larger daycare centers so there will continue to be <coughs> children who can get off at their at their regularly scheduled daycare um, that only really affects 24 ch children um, as opposed to more than 200 okay so this solution still allows you know there may be some children that have to ride more than one bus um, based on the way the schedules are going to work out but it will be many 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 fewer maybe only about 20 yeah. that for whom and those are generally students who attend um, more of the the smaller, more private daycare centers. I think just one question, maybe we'll discuss this later on. The impact of having to stop at these various stops, what would that time uh, yeah. addition mean? Is that something we'll discuss later? Is that okay if we do, Mina? Yes, that, that would be part of, yeah, yeah. that'd be great. Okay, if there are any, no other questions? Okay, so why don't we now, we'll open up our first um, public comment period so anybody that would like to come up we did circulate our policy earlier yeah, so for for people who are watching our policy <coughs> is on the website but basically you're welcome to come up and share any feedback that you have with the school committee we ask people especially because we have a lot of people to limit their comments to three minutes typically we are not going to go back and forth just because it's a business meeting but you will hear us reflect on what you have said when we enter our deliberation and under that agenda item so um, so if there's anybody that would like to comment, and we'll just ask you to say your name and tell us what's on your mind. Yeah, so you have to come up to the mic so the home audience can hear as well. I've never sat at the table here before. <laughs> <laughs> Intimidating. The chairs are less comfortable than out there. <laughs> um, good evening, um, and thank you for, for um, allowing us to speak today. I want to, um, I would like to speak um, about a concern that hasn't been brought up yet, but in anticipation of one that will um, be uh, given today. My name is Laura Kirschenbaum, and I'm a science teacher at the middle school, speaking tonight to express my concern regarding the proposal to eliminate teaching positions at the middle school. Both as a longtime teacher of public school and as a parent of small children going to school in my own hometown of Holden, I can appreciate the financial constraints towns have in meeting the growing needs of our children. I also understand the, the burden community members may face with continuing to increasingly to, to meet the increasingly higher costs as well. 
That being said, until this week, I was under the impression that stated in um, the Legacy Farms article in the Wicked Local publication of October 19th, um, that Hopkinton was a growing community in which people want to live, and that we were considering enrollment trends with anticipated growth. Um, when I read that article and then hear that the middle school is cutting teachers and programs due to decreases in projected enrollment, I cringe at the thought that we may find ourselves struggling to meet the needs of a growing and increasingly diverse community if the enrollment does not actually decrease to the level of their projections. In my view, cutting teachers and programs in a public school can have direct consequences in the delivery of a high quality and robust education to students. I'm concerned that like in my own town, Hopkinton Middle School will be left with high class sizes uh, across the grades and a reduced capacity for meeting the individual needs of all students. Furthermore, losing experienced teachers for which the district has already invested resources in training and professional development prevents a district from fully realizing the investment in teacher talent and skill. In my view, cutting talented and experienced teachers should be a last res resort to cutting spending. Um, I would ask that you re-examine the population projections and investigate uh, potential alternative solutions to shortfalls that do not directly impact uh, students in the classroom. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I feel like an auctioneer going, going. Like, yep, okay. Hello, my name is Matt Garrison. Can you oh. just use the mic? You don't have to move, just use the mic. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. My name is Matt Garrison in Hopkinton, and I attended the last meeting regarding the busing, and I hope some of these points aren't moot, and I'll try and kind of condense what I look, was looking to say. Again, you know, uh, with the different proposal that came out may kind of alleviate some of these things. But, you know, again, I'd like to thank, for, thank you for your time and consideration and the opportunity to discuss the proposed changes. Um, you know, I think following the last meeting, I got a better understanding of what some of the root causes were behind the, the proposed change. Um, you know, I, I would, before kind of getting into the points, uh, like to reiterate how important the flexibility is currently offered to my family. Uh, while we only have two children, it's not feasible for us to be at home five days a week uh, for, for drop-off and the ability to um, have my son go to a daycare facility three days a week after school is integral to the way we operate as a family. It seemed to me from, from the proposal that was discussed at the last meeting, the three primary issues that were kind of leading to the, the, the discussion about the new rule, the new proposed rules were, were cost, time in classroom, and the administrative burden associated with requests for, for busing and, and pickups, um, changes being made throughout the day. When it came to cost, I guess my, my original concern was, you know, it was a rough kind of math um, estimate given that the number of students taking up two, ba two buses equated to two or three additional, you know, buses by way of just the seat capacity, you know. Um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that would, would the savings really come to, to fruition if you were to eliminate the, you know, ability to have multiple stops on different days? Because as I understood it, the, the, the proposed rule change didn't mandate that you got on and off the same, at the same location. So if a child got on a bus at home and, and an off a bus at daycare, isn't that child still taking up two seats? I'm questioning how that results in, in savings of reducing the number of buses. Also, the, we also discussed briefly the geographic aspects of busing and didn't seem like there was much concrete information available on geographically cha how changing the schedule would actually you know, result in, in a decreased number of buses being required. So I still have those questions and I think without kind of having some clarity on that, it's difficult for me to get my arms around the cost aspect of it. The, the time in classroom, it, you know, I don't really have much to say about that other than wondering, was there a consensus on the amount of time they, the administrators thought it would save by reducing the, you know, ability to do different stops on different days? I assume it takes 
a good amount of time to get the kids on the bus, even in the most normal of circumstances. So I'm wondering what, oh, my time's up. Well, you, if okay. you can wrap it up, you All don't right, have sorry. to cut yourself But my last thing, my last point was, you know, the administrative burden, I, I feel that reducing the number of, you know, um, stops that a child could go to, while it may decrease the number of requests that you get for bus changes, wouldn't that just translate to more change requests for people getting picked up by vehicle, which would in turn, you know, potentially increase traffic at the schools? So that's all that I really have to say. The only other thing <coughs> is, uh, that I wanted to note, and just because I didn't really have too much time to digest the, the new proposal that came out, is does that mean the first proposal is off the table and we're only considering the new proposal or are we considering both? Uh, I don't quite understand how, I, I, you got a little clarity where you said that if your child isn't going to a centralized care facility, then they would still have the potential of getting on a second bus if that's what works best to go to the actual care facility they go to. Is that, I think that's correct. And then the only other thing I was curious about was, you know, you, you said you had great conversations with the daycare facilities in the town. I was wondering if any of those highlights or notes were going to be made available to the public so we could kind of get their perspective of what they said in that meeting. I don't think that meeting was open or to the public. I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, you said you had great conversations. I'm just wondering if any of those highlights could be made. Okay. Um, great. Available. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for. No, that's okay. Yeah. Thank no, you. That's great. Anybody else? I thought I saw a hand in the back. Yeah, come on up. My name is Emily Beavis. Um, I just want to say again, thank you so much for um, entertaining the conversation with parents in the community. And I just wanted to second the concern that was made in regard to the length of time on the bus. My um, son is in a neighborhood where he's the, they're, all the children in our neighborhood are the first stop on the bus stop. So they're on the bus for, I think, over 30 minutes. And, you know, I, I just want to thank you so much for coming up with an alternative solution. I'm so grateful that he'll be able to still have the flexibility. Um, I just wanted to raise that, you know, if there's an additional stop on that home bus, it, it may just make things really long for little kids on the bus route. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. Does anybody else have, wanna come up? Yep, okay. Sorry. That's okay. I just don't want you to hesitate and I'll cut you off. Hi, uh, thank you for um, listening to all of our concerns and I appreciate your reading emails and getting back to us as well. Um, I just am looking for a little bit more clarification. I appreciate the proposal and the change and I know that for many of the parents who are concerned, this will alleviate the challenge. Um, my question, I think, more is the impact to after school programs. So with allowing two stops, um, that I think does help a lot of families, but I know we have tried to, to have our uh, first grader go to an after school program sponsored by the HPTA, which would then be a third stop for him um, in the after school. Would that require a, a note every Wednesday when we'd want to send him to that program? How is that going to work? Is that something that you're asking us not to be able to do now? Is that going to impact some of those after school programs where? I need, I don't necessarily need the flexibility to send him to that program as a daycare solution, but as an enrichment opportunity. Um, I'm also wondering if um, we can see the the financial impact. I did, uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to make it to the last meeting, so I saw, saw that on um, the H camp, but I'm just wondering if this isn't the viable financial solution, um, where else is that going to be impacted in the budget? I'm just curious, I think, for my for my own information. Um, and I think that was it. Can we just have your questions. name? Question. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Andrea Rogers. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Come on up. Good evening, I'm Liz Meehan. Um, I have two children uh, in Elmwood School. I'm sick, apologies. Um, I, w when we discussed the busing policy, I think it would be very helpful if you could all 
just give the context for why you were considering the policy in the first place. Because in the last meeting, while we had all read the policy, there was a lot of, um, because we had the parent uh, and teachers talk first, there was just a lot of responses, but no like, this is why we decided to institute the policy for financial reasons or administrative reasons. I did not ever get a clear sense of why it came to be. So I think that would be really helpful as we then hear what the new policy consideration is. Okay, thank you. And also, <laughs> 26 buses stopping at Kidsboro <laughs> at 3.45 in the afternoon. I don't really understand Not how that's going to work. Okay, six. if you can explain that, that'd be terrific. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, going, going, gone. Okay, thank you all very much, and you should expect to hear us reflecting on what we heard um, when we get to that part of the agenda. So next on the agenda is our student council report and we have Rachel Gooley and David Antaki here. Hello, welcome. Hello, thank you for having us as always. Um, so to start, um, let's see. The uh, today, actually, during our advisory, our weekly advisory in school, we had the NEASC survey, which is an organization that every ten years they come to evaluate um, the schools and give feedback for improvement. Um, so they're coming in 2020 is their next visit, and they do a survey a couple years before, which is what we took um, in advisory, um, so that we can. For the next couple of years, we can make improvements before they actually in person come. Um, so parents, teachers, students took the survey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> another thing going on at the school is winter sports, as you've probably heard in the gym. Um, that started this past Monday. Um, also, another thing going on is um, we're going to be starting a mindfulness challenge. If you um, on your way out, you can look at a poster um, hanging up on that wall. And it's going to start tomorrow, and every morning from around 7 to 7.05, it's going to be a challenge to have everyone um, put away their cell phone, cell phone for about five minutes and just, like, reflect and be calm and relax. Yeah. Um, December 7th, which is next Thursday, I believe. Um, it is the holiday concert, the uh, December concert for the bands here, and um, I'll be playing that. In, be playing in that myself, and uh, we play uh, some nice Christmas cr Christmas songs or holiday songs. Um, and what the concert band's doing is we're playing Sleigh Ride. We normally play Slay Ride annually every year, and we're inviting community members, I, bl I believe that's what Mr. Hayes said, uh, we're inviting community members to play with us, oh, cool. and um, yeah, I think that would be, that would be fun. Um, next Friday, or yeah, next Friday, December 8th, um, is that next Friday? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. next Friday um, is our next Hiller Day, so... All the students are looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. And Hiller, Hiller Day is our, like, where the school starts, like, 40 minutes later. I think it's it's been pretty great, I think, because it gives students a little bit of cushion time, just, um, like, it's about twice a month, and just having that, um, that little bit of cushion to do work or just relax or chat with friends is, it's nice. It's relaxing. Um, Students are going to be taking part in the superintendent visits when they're coming here um, to tour the school. Um, students are going to help them tour around the building and um, answer questions or ask questions of the superintendents, just basically to have the students involved in the process of picking super, uh, superintendent or just to be aware of it and just to, to know what's going on. Um, 
a new thing we're going to be trying is Hour of Code and Advisory. Um, Hour of Code, I've done a bit of Hour of Code. It's basically, it's an organization, they have a website and it's to try to encourage students and people, well, anyone really, not just students, to learn code because it's a, it's becoming more and more really important and integral part of, of our world basically. And it's basically just, it, there's beginner to advanced um, activities to learn how to code um, from like doing drag and drop block styles to coding and it's a, something we're going to be trying in advisory. Um, everyone try to do it. There's different activities you can try and and um, yeah, try to get people interested trying code, coding, programming. Very cool. Um, so on December 4th is our next RAD simulation for students taking that class and they will come in at 10 in the morning and then um, they will be able to go home for the rest of the day, so they can kind of relax for that, <laughs> after that. Um, and then on December 19th, a nonprofit organization called One Love, um, they're focused on positive, healthy relationships, is going to come in and have a workshop for the senior class. Um, and some alumni from Hopkinton are going to come back and speak for that um, and help run it. Awesome. Kendall Burdick, I think, was the was the specific alumni leading. Who's going to lead that? Um, come, she was an alumni here. She's going to come back and lead that workshop. And uh, yes, that is that's all we have. If <laughs> you have any questions or you guys are going to be busy. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. it's a it's a great month here at Hopkins High School. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have questions? This sounds quite a lot going on. Good luck with your concert. You. And Thank stay you. mindful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and don't ask me to code. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Thank you guys. You're welcome to stay, but I guess you probably have homework or <laughs> applications or something. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks very much. Us. Thank you. Okay. So are we ready to move right into budget reports? So yeah, so we have our partners from the town. We have um, Brian Hart from the Selectman Office and Rebecca Roback and Mike Manning from Appropriations. So can we make room for them there? And then yep, we'll, work well. we'll and find then a place for our presenters. We'll <laughs> here and we can have, it'll work, okay. it'll be fine. All right, so come on up and um, we'll get started. And at the beginning, we'll get sort of a recap of where we are to date because it's changing, as we all know, day to day. Thank you for coming. And um, I'm okay. ready? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you to Susan Rothermick for preparing this, this overview. One of the things that we um, have talked about wanting to be able to do with all of you as we go through these deliberations is provide you with an update as to where we were, where we are, some of the decisions that we've made along the way. Um, and we will continue to do that um, as we move forward. But this is, uh, you can see November the 2nd. Uh, where we began with uh, an increase of 8.9 percent. Why, why isn't this moving? No. Go ahead. And you're still at 8.9 percent. <laughs> <laughs> but as we move through the evening, we hope to reduce this percent. Oh, and there we are, magic, 2 percent. Uh, reduction. Um, so we've talked about this at length, and this is if we separate the out of district costs. Um, I don't know what she just did, so I'll just is it this? Okay, um, that would reduce that would re result in a two percent reduction, and we know we all know because we've talked at length about what this means in terms of the out of district costs. But what we're interested in talking about in more detail tonight is where we are in terms of payroll and expense. Um, this is the first time um, in, in the past several years that we're looking at a difference 
um, and it's the 2% that we're talking about, the payroll has been consistently at 82% over the past several years. And you're now seeing in where we are currently in the budget that payroll is already, um, as we compare it to the total budget, uh, representing 80% of the budget um, and expense is representing 20. And Sue's going to talk to, you know, we're going to be explaining what the drivers are around that. Uh, but I want to note that that's a change to, to the way it's looked. Um, so just jump in at any at yep. any point. Mm -hmm. um, here are the personnel increases overall. And this does include um, what we're going to be talking about on the 14th. So when we talk more about increases to the budget um, around personnel, we're looking at elementary teachers across the district. Um, we're looking at the related specialists. So of course we understand that when we increase a classroom at the elementary level, it means that we also have to increase the specials that, the, that those students, that classroom teacher, a specials teacher, an art, music, phys ed, um, related services even, can only teach so many sections in a day, in a week. And if it rises above the number of contractual sections that they can teach, that results in an increase. So as we increase our enrollments, as we increase the needs for more teachers, so too does, does that increase the need for uh, the specialists, and that's what we mean when we refer to specialists. Um, you will hear more tonight about the START program. We had a wonderful presentation about that. So the 1.5 adjustment counselor increases uh, include the teacher to the START program as well as, as an additional 0.5 at one of the elementary schools that you'll hear more about on the 14th. Uh, you'll be hearing about a math coach. You've already heard about a custodian. Um, L teachers you'll be hearing more about tonight in Carol's budget presentation. Um, this is an ever increasing need in our district. And then um, facilities use secretary. Sorry, did you want to add anything? No. Why don't you go ahead and do this slide um, under expense. So under the expenses, um, you, you've heard most of uh, the beginning part, the technology through the technology presentation, the central office increase. Again, this is a year um, the bus contract is, is out for bid. So that's an estimated increase for the busing contract. Um, curriculum professional development, slight decrease, um, which you'll hear about tonight. Athletics, which you heard about in the previous evening that it still includes the um, increase for the AEDs, which you'll take up this evening about potentially pulling those out to be a capital item, but that increase still is a reflection of uh, including those. Regular education, so that is the increase in expenses um, across the board, across all five schools. Uh, building and grounds, that is really basically utilities. That's the increase, which you heard about before. Occupational day, that is um, students that go to Norfolk Aggie. There's been an increase in the number of students that are electing to go there rather than Keefe Tech or stay in district. And special education, of course, you've heard about already. Why don't you continue? So taking back, this is really just kind of bringing you back where we were November 2nd and where we are uh, at this point in time. So again, this is a working budget. As you're hearing presentations, we're still coming back to the table and discussing more with everybody that's going on. Um, so what you'll hear more about tonight are some of these items and some that you've already heard. So again, the working budget uh, on November 2nd is at the top. We were at 8.9%. Tonight you'll hear um, a potential for the middle school reduction of FTEs technology you heard about in the last presentation of a reduction of 1.0 FTE and high school will also uh, propose um, a 0.6 FTE. You'll hear more about that tonight. Um, special education, this is a small change in student need which resulted in a reduction. Um, and again, as I said, we keep going back and, re and looking and revising. So the building and grounds in Elmwood that's a small change, you know, really just a budgeting and, and formula that we're able to find. The athletics, this is a proposal that you heard about as a potential to increase the fee um, from 110 to 200. 
uh, that's still on the table. It is not something that has been decided. But with those reductions, that still brings you down to a working budget of 7.9. And again, we keep talking about the taking out the out of district, um, seeing just because this year seems to be an anomaly from previous years. And so if we kind of separate that conversation, it's really a message. It's not that that piece of the budget goes away. Um, you're bringing your budget, working budget down to 5.9%. So that's where we are now prior to hearing from the elementary schools. So this is just kind of setting us up to where we are today. Before we hear from our, um, our presenters tonight, I, I think I, I also want to make a statement regarding um, the process that we've been through. And, um, and the fact that despite the hours and hours and hours of time and looking at absolutely everywhere, um, what has also continued to be a lens that comes to the discussion is maintaining the excellence in our schools. And we heard from a teacher tonight um, at the, from the middle school in terms of you know the importance of maintaining the programs and, and our services within our schools. That is always the lens that is coming to the discussion. So the very, very difficult discussions, you will start to hear more and more about how, I mean, we are, we are there is nowhere else to go. And I say this because I want to reinforce the fact that we have, we took seriously the, um, the message that was for us to work towards 3.5. Uh, that is where we began. That is the message that has been going out to, you know, to all of our faculty. Um, we spoke about it today with a group of teachers. And as we began to get into the reality of building the budget and understanding the impact of something that is no surprise to any of us, which is the increasing enrollment and the increased L population. It is, becomes impossible to reach a goal of 3.5 and maintain program. Because as you know in our budget, and you've heard this over and over again, but when 82% of the budget is, is, is uh, based on salary, there's, there's nowhere to go. So the lens that I always bring and what I'm always asking of the administrative team is when we're adding to the budget, are there places where we can take away? Are there things that we're doing right now that we can no longer do because we're doing A? Does that mean we no longer have to do B? Um, and the answer has been resoundingly no. We've done that already. We've done that work over the past few years of really trying to weed things out that, um, that maybe we can be doing without. But I feel I am saying to you now, with confidence that in order to preserve the quality of the program that we have, the services that we provide to students, um, that the only way to do that is to start to look at reducing the things that we're offering uh, within our district. And I want to say that before they begin because I, again, as, I, as you always hear me say, but I just want to thank the entire administrative team for the work that they've been doing and the, the scrutiny that they have brought to this process. Um, and I think that was our last, yeah, that was, that was the end of the slide. Any questions on the overview before we begin to look at individual budgets tonight? I, I have one question on the athletics increase fee. Is it off of the $200 or is it the $90 increase? This is based on a $90 increase. Um, Sue and I discussed and, and we heard the feedback from the school committee about looking at a graduation between instead of going from zero to 100, so instead of all or nothing. Um, and we decided that when you look at the total and where we are, it really isn't going to be very meaningful. So it seemed that we can certainly do that work if you want us to. Um, but if we're going to see any kind of a difference, it, 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 it feels like we're, we're going to have to make a significant change there. So, Kathy, I guess my question was, is the 128K based on $200 times yeah. the number yes. of students or 90? It's, so it's an 90 increase in 90 to a $200 charge. Right. So okay. that's the increase in revenue, the $90, that's the increase that it represents. But it's 200 per student. So that is per 200 school. times the number of students. No. No, no it's still the 90. 
No, no, no. It's the 90 because it's the it's incremental the value. Fair enough. Okay. That's oh, good right. to know. Right. The incremental value. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can I good. ask a question yeah. too? Um, so if we take the AEDs out of the athletic department mm -hmm. um, budget mm -hmm. and put them in, into our capital, mm -hmm. what, what would that? I, I don't remember the amount of it. It's 33,000. Okay. So unfortunately, it actually doesn't really change our percentage no. much. Okay. Um, but every little bit counts. Every, right. Mm -hmm. No, of course, of course. I just thought right. was the only thing I yeah, so I, I, I did play with the number just to see if the percentage would change because yeah. it would be nice to show, but it you can just point something stayed there. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. No question. A few more decimal places. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, anybody else with questions? I, I really like the previous slide that gives a good perspective on where all um, the changes have happened. So very okay. helpful. Thank any you. anybody from the other corner of the table <laughs> there? I just have one question, which is, um, do you know, and I know that you're new, so that I'm putting it on the spot, how much, what percentage the out-of-district costs were in previous budgets on average? I know 2% this year, was it you know, half a percent or? I, it, honestly, I don't know, but, the, <coughs> but in looking at previous years, this just seems to be a year that is an anomaly in terms of the change in placements and then also that circuit breaker change. So those two combined together, mm -hmm. it, you know, created a, a real budget issue. Yeah. So what I don't understand, if you could go, the last slide that was up, maybe some, so we have the uh, out of district cost increase, the 842,000, right, so that you just talked about. But what are the other drivers that are bringing that five point, bringing it up to 5.9%? if everything else is fairly steady. I don't understand why that's six. We haven't had continuous 6% increases year over year. Right. So it's the increases that are reflected in here, right? That's a lot. That's right there. We're looking at 11 and a half, 11.5 teachers. But where, okay, so where is that in numbers, Dr. Oh. McLeod? So in terms of dollars, you know what I'm saying? If you go to another, yeah, is that in there somewhere? No, it'll be in payroll. Right. right, it's here. The <coughs> so, so we didn't what, we what didn't break out just the the cost of the personnel increases. So that all is in there. Just in that contractual thing. plus personnel, right? Exactly. What well, might be helpful for future is I know in the past we have seen that breakout, which is new payroll versus contractual increased payroll. That might be a, a helpful slice for the next time we have this conversation. Yeah. It's a little more complicated to present only because it's a negotiation year. So this slide reflects the 14 FTEs that are on the next slide, right? Mm -hmm. I can't it includes it. Count so all it includes this, it. Is, okay. this is where we're at right now before we begin the building level discussion. And we wanted to give you that background to, for, for as you're listening to the presentations so that you can see you know where we're at we're still we're still way beyond where we had hoped to be at this point in the process okay. so at what point do we sort of marry up the new drivers for cost which are teachers which we have a growing community which everyone gets when do we marry that up against the revenue the new revenue that also comes in with the you know the added costs. When when does that come out? When do we see that? Is that at the selectman level? I yeah, mean, I mean the revenue doesn't go to. We don't get the chapter seventy. That goes to the town. I mean the new growth goes to the town. But the new growth is what offsets this new cost that's coming from the growth, the new growth revenue, right? Right. So I think from a from a conservative standpoint, uh, state aid. I believe is level funded in the uh, financial model that was presented to the, the selectmen. So because you don't know um, where the budget will land, whether it's an extra $10 per student, extra $50 per student, it's somewhere, you know, some magic number. So it's the increase in the enrollment and then what the state is going to give for that increased number of students. So the financial model that you're working with right now, I do believe um, level funds state aid. But doesn't the chapter 70 also work like the circuit breaker in that 
for the new students who are coming in this year, we're not going to reflect that revenue until next year. Right. So we have to essentially advance fund the Make growth for it because we're not going to get reimbursed until a year out. Right. And, and I, reimbursed is, I mean, it's not like we get a ton of money for it. But we're a year in arrears for that. Same with Circle Breaker. But I think the other thing that you might be asking is what percentage are we um, basing for Circuit Breaker? In, the, in this model? Is that, are you also asking that question? Because it's gone down 10% over the last two years. So I think you're being. So that yet yeah, the uh, percentage that we were reimbursed, if, that we're being reimbursed this year is at 65%. And I'm using that same assumption for next year. And from what I see on the listserv, that's what most districts are doing. Um, because we're at a very low point in coming from the state, and so to um, assume higher is probably not a good position. Okay. So I have a question. I know you said because of um, negotiation, in effect, you didn't want to break it out. But I do think it's pretty important for the budget drivers, especially the personnel increases, just to throw a ballpark in there. You maybe use, you know, if you had, I don't think I've seen a year we've had more than <coughs> four to five increases in here, you know, we're, we're t t over 10, 12. So I think it's important to know how, what the impact is on the budget. Yeah. Even, if, even if it's just a, a rough ballpark, mm -hmm. I, think it, I think it would help. Yeah. I mean, I think the point <coughs> she was making is because we're negotiating, we don't know the COLA yeah. because they're, you know, the contract ends at the end of this fiscal year. So I, I think that was really the point. But, right. but I do we think can, we, we know, can, we understand we the contract right. is the contract. You can't disclose that, but adding personnel and the impact is, mm -hmm. is, is important. Right, right, right. We could do the, the, um, the staff at the current rates. Yeah, well, that'll be I'm an asking. important thing for you to know on the 14th. That will be the last, our last meeting before the final recommendation. So it'll be important that we be able to break that out for you. I think, Mike, something that's important to understand when we look at this and it seems like, man, that seems like a huge jump. Um, is that we've been really holding back at the center school over the past three years in terms of increasing staff, even though there would have been a demand for them because there was nowhere to put them. And the class sizes have been growing and growing and growing. Each year, you would have seen less of a jump here if had we been adding, as you know, there would certainly have been an argument to add additional teachers at the center school over the past at least two years. Uh, we're facing class size of 24, 25. And the only reason we are is that they're literally, they, everybody's on a cart. They're like hanging from the from the rafters. So, um, you know, that at least that would at least account for three of these positions that would have already been in the budget from previous years. Believe me, I understand that. Yeah. Over the, you know, going through this for the sure. process for the last couple of years, but I do think this is the big spike. Okay. And that's why it's important to know. No, what no, it is I, what yeah, we're yeah. Yeah. no. Your point is well taken. We can try to. Yeah, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is this slide. This, this is part of the slides that we presented at the very beginning of the budget process. So as you can see, um, you don't see in here some of the adjustments that have been made, such as what you will hear tonight on some of the reductions. So those reductions have come after the fact, so that's not reflected here. Okay. So we're continuing to work with each one of the, uh, the buildings in, in trying to figure this out. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so are we ready to start with we the individual are. budget well, presentation? We can turn this over to Dr. Kavanaugh at this point. Great. Gee, can I ask one yes, more question? Yes, of course. Please? So, Mike, when will we have the projections for new growth to match up against the projections for new costs needed based on growth? When will that come out? Like, you know, if we have a six, take out that 800,000, whatever, and it's a 6% increase year over year, and we've got a new growth of 6% or 3% town-wide that matches up to the 6%. When do we know that? I mean, we are growing as a community. Right. So for the 2019 budget, we have estimates at this point. We don't know what it is until a year from now. But I know I can't, I can't give the exact number. I know um, Chris uh, Sandini has the, has the numbers in front of him. It's Right now, is it 2.2, 2.3 million is the new growth? I know he gave a number that yeah. is higher, but I don't know how it's been released. 
it's, it's, but it's, again, it's just an estimate. I, I do think, I, I think you're right, Mike. I think <coughs> that the number that was built into the model that we all saw on September 12th at our last budget advisory meeting, I think he felt optimistic that that number was low what he, uh, based on what he was seeing now. So that's great. I don't know that it's that much too low, but, um, but it was going in, in a positive direction. So, so that was good. I don't know how, I don't know enough about that process, that part of the process to know how, when he would update that in a confident way, or if that's just a general trend. I mean, it's one thing if new growth on the revenue side matches up to growth on the cost side because the community's growing and we need additional teachers, yeah. et cetera. It's another thing if the new growth doesn't keep up with where the costs are. So right. I think that's kind of the key question that maybe we're a little early to try and figure out. But no, I agree. Six percent is going to make a lot of people very nervous. But right. six percent of new growth, or three percent, you know, on this side anyway of the ledger, matching up to the six percent town wide or what have you, it, it should work out fine. Well, and what we also don't know is, you know, new growth affects every department in the town. You know, not just the schools. And so, you know, we don't know what the impact is right now on, on the town departments as well. So that'll be obviously a factor in how that gets allocated but um, yeah. yeah so I mean if as the sooner we can get an update on that the better obviously um, so that we all know where we are and we're not working so much in a vacuum but um, we'll okay. keep trying to chisel away that okay so unless there are other questions we'll let dr. Kavanaugh get started okay so I have really tried to keep the professional development and curriculum budgets um, fairly level funded, um, but there have been some mandatory increases, things that over which we really have no control. So I will talk a little bit about um, personnel first. If you look at the slide that has the personnel increases, you'll see that I have two L teachers up there. In September, we did add an additional L teacher just based on student demand. And so that's one of the teachers that you see up there for FY19. She's there because she's already working in the district right now, but we didn't budget her for FY18. So we will need to add an additional teacher in FY19 to be able to meet all of those student needs. This year alone, we have had, in terms of gains and losses, we have over 50 new L students in the district this year, which really should be, to my thinking, two teachers. Um, so right now, we are kind of busting at the seams, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that maybe in January, we're going to be back in this place looking for another teacher for the second half of the school year. Um, and I am saying that because since the, uh, the October 1st SIMS data was at 48, we have seven more kids to screen right now, and they just keep coming. And what typically happens in February, which is the summer vacation for the Southern Hemisphere, we will get a lot of South American children who will join our schools in February. So since the last time we agreed that we needed more, kid, more teachers, we have had, um, better, I think, 11 new students since that time. If we get a few more, we're probably going to need another teacher. And one of the things that we look at is, you know, the state sets out goals and guidelines for us, and they are guidelines. And what they would tell us is if a student comes to our district and has absolutely limited or no English at all, that kid is considered to be a level one student. And so what we've been doing in K-1 and 2 is we don't give them the two mandated 50-minute periods a day. We only give them one because they are in a very language-rich environment all day long. So we are really getting by now um, sort of under the guidelines, but I don't think that we can get away with that much longer because our teaching force just can't keep up with it. At one, at right now, our teacher with the greatest caseload has 30 students on her caseload. We don't have other teachers in the district with 30. And if you think about the way that works, we do progress reports on all of those L's all the time. And the other thing that we have our teachers doing is that they have to do progress reports on the kids that we call FELs. Those are the former English learners. So in November of 2016, we had 86 students who were L's and 37 FELs. That's a lot of paperwork. This year at this time, we have 134 L's and we have 56 L's. So that's an awful lot of work for the five teachers that we have in the classrooms every day. So um, that's the reason then for my, my 2.0 um, increase there. Other than that personnel, I think 
um, really the other things that you're looking at in my budget that are increases are textbooks. So I have world language textbooks. Those are moving into, we had a seventh grade Mandarin in um, the middle school this year. And so now all of those seventh graders are moving to the eighth grade. So we need to buy textbooks for them. And that was budgeted at 10,000. We also are working to bring science textbooks into the middle school. Um, this year, grade seven is slated for that. That's a $30,000 expenditure. The high school needs Algebra I textbooks. Those subscriptions are expiring. We're looking at $30,000 for that. And sort of the good news is that AP Physics is expanding. We have a lot more kids who want to take that course. And so there's $7,000 there just because we need to augment the number of textbooks that we have at this point. One of the things that we did do in terms of decreases, we have um, our K to five math subscriptions are all expiring at the end of this year. We believe that Envision Math, who is the company that we work with right now, is going to extend us for a year for free while we do an entire textbook search. I know, I'm hoping that this works out the way it's planned. Uh, yes. So it will, be, it will be wonderful if that buys us a year to really do a thorough search of textbooks and resources to see what, what we really want to buy in terms of what do we need that will best match the state frameworks. Um, Ed Reports will tell us that the product that we're working right now is, is moderate in terms of its match to the framework. So what we need to do very frequently with what we already have is augment. You know, we, we continue to put in different pieces. So I would say those are my two big things. The last thing I have in here that's an increase is $20,000 for translation and interpretation. Legally, all of the forms and documents that we have in the district have to be translated into the various languages so that parents can access those. And we have begun that process, and we you know, have to provide interpreters for um, families who don't speak English or for families who use sign language. And in the process of doing that, it will cost us about $20,000 next year to you know, get us up to speed where we need to be to be in compliance, and and that's one of those areas of compliance that you can't. There's no wiggle room. Okay. Questions? So can I ask a question about the L teachers? So, it, you you were saying that you think you'll be coming back to us in January, potentially be. for that second L teacher. So, were you thinking, but that for the FY19 budget, two can be our run rate, so you're just ex sort of accelerating that second hire into this year, or do you think I mean, it's too, too low? It, it's really difficult to predict, because you, in previous years, we've had about 30 L students a year, and this year, 77 have come in, but we've exited students, so our net gain right now is 51. My guess is by the time we get to the end of this school year, we will have had 60 L students join our public schools. So if we had just those two students, and I mean, if those two teachers and those 60 students, it would work, but that does not account for anyone who might be entering in FY19. And is an L teacher, is an L teacher a, a teaching position or is it a para? No, it's a teaching it's position. A teaching there position. is okay. ELE certification. Okay. I had asked a question, um, and Dr. Kavanaugh had clarified this uh, earlier for me, that the projected salary, right, is, you know, if we look at what is the average that you see in Massachusetts for an L teacher, it's in the 50,000 range, or what we are projecting is a bit higher, and um, Dr. Kavanaugh, if you don't mind talking to that a little bit, please. No, if you take a look at the teacher salary schedule in the contract for this year, um, and you looked at all of those steps and lanes, there are only three steps on which there is a salary that would be in the $50,000 range. Everything else, and if there are 100 steps, that means 97 of them are above 59.9, right? So it, it's very unlikely we're going to find someone to be an L teacher in the Hopkinton Public Schools in that $50,000 range. The other issue that we have been encountering is in the last year we have advertised twice uh, for L teachers and I will say that because there is such an enormous demand for them right now, uh, the, the resume pile is usually very small. We get five or six applicants and the resumes are typically pretty weak. Um, we just recently, the woman that we hired in um, September, we got from another district and we were very, very lucky to, to find her. But because she was an experienced teacher, you know, she came at a cost. Thank you. I mean, it helped me knowing that, you know, so much thought and research had gone in there. Um, 
The other question I have for you, I know, uh, you know, I, I could see the parallel. Uh, you had sent a note out uh, the survey asking the community to participate in the STEAM initiative. Um, you know, I want to hear more about it. But in that same spirit, I recall when we had a conversation a couple of months ago about ELL, you were interested in the fact that I can speak a foreign language. Is there any plan to tap into the community, uh, possibly, to help out in this area? What the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will tell us is that for translation purposes and interpretation purposes, if you have someone who is certified to teach a world language in your school district, you can use those people for translation and interpretation. So right now we do have a spreadsheet and our teaching faculty is wonderful. They will come and, and do it for uh, the curriculum writing hourly wage, which is substantially less than their regular hourly wage. So we are grateful to them to come to different meetings and work as interpreters and even take some of our documents. So if, for example, at the Elmwood School we're having pajama day and we know that we have a couple of families who don't speak English, but we want to make sure that the parents know that those children need to come in pajamas, those teachers will work on those translations for us so that they can go home in the backpacks with you know, all of the other kids. So that's sort of the extent to which we can use those. I see. Mm -hmm. Um, and one last question was holding back on the textbook purchases. Would that cause a challenge for our teachers? Um, I have been meeting with the teachers at Elmwood and Hopkins about this very issue. We've had uh, one meeting, the uh, rep from Envisions is coming to talk with us in early December and um, they seem to think that it's going to be fine if we live that year because they feel like they have enough materials and you know enough guidance through the curriculum frameworks to work through this year especially if we get the Envision product at no cost um, but you know we can't obviously sustain that for years so one thing that I would caution everyone here to be uh, aware of is that in the FY20 budget we're not going to just need K2 five textbooks, we're going to need K to eight math textbooks. So that's going to be an enormous expenditure when we're all sitting here next year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one question, um, and it may be more of a Susan question. In, I know in the past, um, for expenses rated, related to foreign language and mostly specifically to Mandarin, we've been able to use the F1 visa money. Can we use our F-1 visa account to buy the textbooks, or is there not enough? Can we take we're, it out of we're the account? We're using that account to the extent that we can okay. already within the budget. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you all have questions? No. Okay. And just for context for people who um, haven't been to all of our fun budget meetings, um, so you understand, the town has asked us to drive towards a 3.5% budget increase. So if you were paying attention earlier on these slides, you can see that we're more than double that right now. So just, I wasn't sure that you all had the context of that, um, the overall, you know, <laughs> what we're being asked to do versus what where we are right now. So um, just might help you understand a little bit better what the conversation is that you're hearing. Um, so, okay, unless there are other questions for Dr. Kavanaugh, can we, uh, Squish up and make room for Mr. Bishop, I think, is next. A big squish. A big squish. Just find some body heat going, maybe. Welcome. I like your tie. Very, thank you. Go very ahead. Hillers. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about the high school our budget proposal and all the work that we have done to get to this point. Um, I know that you have the executive summary in front of you, so I thought I would just talk a little bit about some of the highlights and not go through it word for word. Um, I, I do think it's important to mention before I start to talk about personnel and expense accounts that we have, I have met with SMLs, um, directors, um, administrators at the high school as well as central office over the last two months to gain their feedback to have this proposal for this budget. Um, and we have already made some significant cuts and changes um, to the initial budget request that we had back in the end of September, uh, beginning of October, totaling over about $80,000. So I just want to take a second to, to thank all of the people that uh, were part of this process in developing the budget here for the high school. 
So we'll first go to uh, personnel. Uh, we are asking for an increase of a 1.0 FTE for an adjustment counselor um, to, uh, for our START program. Uh, START stands for Student Therapeutic Academic Resource Team. I know it's a program that you are well aware of. About a month and a half ago, the team came and was recognized for all the great work that they were doing. But for those of you who might not know about the program, it is uh, in place to help students transition back into the school when they've missed a, a number of days of school, when they've had excessive absences based on medical conditions, maybe psychiatric reasons, uh, or having post-concussive uh, syndrome. Um, the main goal is to help the students re-enter and reintegrate back into the school community. And the reason that we are asking for the funding for this position is that we are at the final year of a three-year grant that we got from the Metro West Health Foundation. Um, and when we signed the contract back three years ago, we talked about if this program is going to be effective in its mission and cost effective, that we would look to fund this position. And I think that we have exceeded in both of those areas. Uh, we've collected a tremendous amount of data. Um, for example, our students uh, being hospitalized has gone down 75% over the last three years for mental health reasons. That number is even lower for students that need to be re-hospitalized. Students are getting back into the classroom quicker uh, ha after having a concussion based on the support that they're getting from this uh, program. And also we have, had to lean less on spe uh, special education and have less referrals in, in general based on this program helping with students, particularly around the idea of social emotional learning, which is a goal both in our strategic plan and our school improvement uh, plan here at the high school, goal number three. So um, to me, it's a program that is necessary not only for our high school, but for any high school and any middle school. Um, it, it has had such a significant impact um, over the last three years. I actually went to a Metro West Health uh, Adolescent Foundation uh, conference at the beginning of November, and we had one of our students and parents present on the panel, and our high school team and middle school team do workshops, and they were probably the most attended workshops of the whole conference. And I quickly realized that we are uh, ahead of the curve, and people are trying to emulate what we're doing in this, in this area. Um, and so, yeah, obviously, we know the climate of where we're at with the budget, um, and, and we talk about what we're going to do FTE-wise. This was a top priority for us. And so that's really the only uh, position that we're asking for at the high school at this time. Um, Dr. McLeod mentioned earlier, we are looking to try to do our best to balance off this increase and, and level off our, our, our personnel summary. Um, so we, we have been looking and having conversations with staff and feel that we can make a cut of about of a 0.6 position at this point. Um, and, and feel like we can still offer the, the services that we currently have. So uh, when you think about it, we're asking for a 1.0 increase, but making a 0.6 cut, so overall it's about a 0.4 increase personnel-wise at the high school. In regards to our expense summaries, um, we have 37 equipment, supply, textbook, or other expenditure accounts at the high school, 20 of which are either level funded or show a decrease compared to FY18. Of the 17 remaining accounts, uh, 10 of which show a very minimal increase of $1,000 or less. And overall, when you take all 37 of those accounts who are up $26,000 from FY18 to FY19. So I thought I'd talk just uh, briefly about some of those accounts that are over uh, $1,000 and then take any questions that you have about the budget. Um, first, we have an increase of about $2,200 in our history textbook account. Um, this is uh, specifically for our AP psychology class. That's one of the most popular classes at the high school. We have about 180 plus seniors take it each year and they do tremendously well on the, on the um, exam. Uh, but the book is more of a consumable workbook and in the past we've had students pay for that at the beginning of the year. And we felt with conversations that I've had with the department head and the AP Psych team that we felt we could absorb that cost for them moving forward. So that's where the increase is coming from in that account. Um, Mr. Hay came two weeks ago and talked about the music supply account increase. I don't think I need to address that here tonight. The next two increases are based solely on student interest and student enrollment, which I think is exciting. We have an increase in our co-curricular supply account of $2,300, and that's because of some new clubs that we've established, but also supporting some new classes that we offer, uh, one of which is ballroom dancing that Karen Renault, our new SML and wellness, is, is brought. Um, and so some of that increase is to, to, to put some transportation in place to take some field trips to some local uh, companies that offer ballroom dancing. Also, um, Business Professionals of America, it's a, it's a club that we started with Doug Scott a few years ago. That continues to increase and some of our students are attending some, uh, some national level conferences who so are trying to pay for the registration when it comes to that. And along those same lines, we've had a student each of the last two years in our mu music program get um, selected for nationals down in Tennessee. And the parents have been assuming the, the cost of the registration. So we felt it was our responsibility to, to pay for that registration. So that's some of the increases when it comes to that particular account. You see a pretty big increase in our technology and engineering account of $9,000, and that's a program that has continued to um, 
uh, increase in terms of student enrollment. Uh, it's a program that it consists of AP Computer Science, uh, Engineering, Team Robotics, Marketing, uh, our HHS TV show that you, know, you may see on the website, but that's a class here at the high school. Uh, and I think I can uh, attribute it to the time that we brought Doug Scott in, in, in just that enthusiasm that he brought to the department. Um, so we went from having three or four robotics teams to now probably having 11 next year. And a lot of money gets associated with consumables and goods that they need for their, for their trips and their um, competitions. We're also producing um, more when it comes to our marketing class and our HHS TV class on a more consistent basis. So there's just costs associated with productions that we're, we're, we're putting out more often than we have in the past. So that's why that account is up more so than the other ones. Um, the, we also have a, a $1,500 increase in our wellness equipment maintenance account and that's really for just upkeep in our fitness center downstairs. We have a treadmill that's not functional at this point. So um, <clears throat> kids are using that during the day with wellness class as well as after school with athletics. So uh, we wanted to build in some money within this account to at least replace the treadmill and also just general upkeep of, of the fitness center. Um, we have a $5,600 increase in our principal's professional development account. And it's not for me to take a trip to Aruba, but um, <laughs> it's more associated with our NIAS visit. I know David, uh, one of our wonderful students, talked a little bit about this earlier. Every 10 years, we need to apply for reaccreditation. And our visit is in November of 2020, but the process starts three years ahead of time. So we have already begun to select our steering committee, our self-reflection committee. We sent out the surveys today. but the. The reason for this increase is next October we have our collaborative conference where NEASC sends two or three individuals from that um, agency and they come and do an assessment <coughs> at the school. And we have to pay for lodging, transportation, food, and that's just part of the expectation of, of, of NEASC. So that's where that increase comes from. And then in 2020 there'll probably be another increase within this account to pay for the full team to come out and, and do the visit. And the last account is uh, that's up uh, $4,600 is our undistributed equipment account, and that is based solely on our new copier lease um, that I'm sure Susan can talk a little bit more okay. about. Um, but that, that's, that's um, kind of what we have at the high school. I think overall I, we've worked hard to, to present a, a fiscally responsible budget, but also a budget that uh, is going to continue to keep our programs moving in the right direction and support our kids uh, both on the academic side as well as the extracurricular side. So happy to answer any questions that you have about the budget. I, I do want to say that just looking at your budget you know, and your presentation right now, clearly a lot of thought has gone in and you know, your team has spent a lot of time um, doing all of this. Um, my question too is where you're trying to present a very fiscally responsible budget with the growing population <coughs> and some of the concerns that we had heard from parents earlier this year about the AP program. Do you feel comfortable that with the budget and with your ask, you would be able to keep the quality of education and provide all the programs um, that we're looking for our kids? That's a good question. Uh, I do, I, I do, uh, but I think if we continue to see an increase in the amount of students coming to the high school, we'll probably have to come back to the table. But um, we, I feel, have done a, a, a pretty decent job of over the last three or four years slowly adding staff as opposed to coming here and asking for two new additional staff members when the numbers are up. So we've been kind of building a little bit of a cushion for uh, students as they move in. We have a, a very large ninth grade class that we've been preparing for for probably three years now. Um, so I do feel that even with the, the 0.6 cut that we'll, we'll potentially make, we'll be still in a good place staffing wise. But if the numbers continue to increase, I think we'll probably have to have a discussion on that. Um, also in terms of you know, some of the programs, some new programs that you may be thinking of, and again, I go back to the note that Dr. Kavanaugh had sent earlier this week, which I want to hear more about, um, about tapping into the community and how the community can help out. Do you want to share any thoughts on that? You know, what are some of the new programs which are on your mind? Sure, yeah, yeah, we have uh, quite a few actually. Um, in, but in terms of talking about the community, we've been trying to bring them in a variety of different ways. We've been bringing some community members in from, from Dell, EMC, with our, our business classes. Um, we, we bring in the fire department and the police department for our engineering classes. Uh, we have guest speakers from Hansborough that, uh, that, that work in the community. So um, we, we do our best to try to bring in as many community members, members as possible. Um, but in regards to new programs, we're always trying to think of new and innovative ways uh, to, to engage our students. We're, we're talking about adding more coding classes next year. And we, we're setting up our program of studies probably in mid to, to late January. So we've already started having conversations about new classes that we can add that wouldn't have a budgetary impact. We would just shift around some staffing. Um, 
uh, Mr. Han and Mr. Palmerville and I have talked about teaching a leadership class for seniors. Um, I continue to talk to, to, to Mr. Scott about um, bringing in different uh, kind of engineering classes, uh, sustainable engineering classes um, that we don't currently offer, but uh, we're always engaging in the conversation of trying to, 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 to have new programs. I know that Ms. King t came and talked about a unified sports program uh, in our athletic department, so there's, there's, there's constant communication about how we can continue to be um, to continue to have high expectations and, and continue to engage students and, and provide what they want to take and what they want to, to learn about. So we're always trying to engage that conversation with the kids. Okay, great. Um, the last question I have is pe uh, professional development for the teachers. Mm -hmm. Is that part of your budget or would it be? Uh, it's, it's a little bit of both. So we each have a little bit of money that we can spend towards professional development. So that account is just specifically for the, the principal's professional development account and account, uh, encompasses the whole administration. Um, but we have uh, an account for our professional development that's separate from, from this budget. Um, and there was a line item uh, that said, seemed to say distance learning. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to that a little bit, please? Yeah, so uh, that, that account is uh, money that we spend towards uh, online learning and online seats, both through VHS and through tech. Uh, so typically we have around 50 to 75 students per semester take an online course. Um, it is kind of a first come, first serve process, but typically the seniors and juniors have first crack at the online classes. Um, and the online classes are usually classes that we don't offer here, or, or that don't fit in their schedule based on other classes they want to take. And so that's, um, um, we encourage every kid to try, we don't have anything necessarily in writing, but to try to take one online class before they graduate to, to prepare themselves for, for post-secondary uh, education. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't have any questions. I just want to say, again, one of the things I really appreciate about this, this budget presentation is how um, student-focused the programming is at the high school, which I know sounds kind of silly, of course, it's student-focused, but I mean, just the, the level of programs and the responsiveness you have to interest. So um, it, it's great to find creative solutions to allow students to take advantage of these rather than saying we can only afford 30 seats. It, you know, we have to take the first 30. So. Um, so I really appreciate it, and I think the community appreciates the offerings that Hopkinton um, High School provides, and there's a lot of work that goes into being able to balance that. Um, I would also put in a plug for those w watching who are not familiar with the Stark program that we're funding for the first time. Is the video out on It is, YouTube. yeah, it's on our website, yeah. On, yeah so it, it go, the video that was presented at our meeting a, a month or so ago, um, it, it, nobody could watch that video and not want to fund this thing, at, at least at this level. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Well, and I think what's not reflected in that video is how much, aside from the fact that it's such a better support for our students, it saves us money. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's not mm -hmm. your purpose in doing it, but that's, you know, that's a lovely side benefit, particularly in the context of this year. So thank you. And I mean, I would just echo, echo what John said about the, the, the authenticity of what's offered in the program of studies to the, what the students are interested in. Obviously, they have requirements that they have to meet, but beyond that, what they're interested in learning, um, which is helping them, you know, drive their decisions in terms of um, what they do after they leave the high school. I think the fact that you're always so um, engaged with them about what those interests are and able to, I mean, I think it's a great credit to our faculty that they're so flexible in what they're able to teach um, and so that you're able to add new courses, I mean, that are new, um, that, you know, are exciting to the kids, but that the, the teachers are, you know, able to teach and probably very excited to teach. So, I mean, I just, I think it speaks to the value of um, the education that the kids are getting here. And so, I mean, that just kind of left out, I think, from the, um, from the presentation, but also just year over year, just hearing how much within the context, working within what you have, you've been able to expand and, um, what you offer. So I think that that's, that's a great model and I know that that's more easily, not that it's easy, but more easily managed in a high school schedule um, than at any other building. But um, so thank you for doing that. I, I don't really have any other questions other than you know, just that comment, but I wanna make sure, unless you guys have questions, that we have a chance for our partners over here. With 11 robotics teams, yeah, that's great. Remember, we're struggling to fund one, yes, so that was through our grants. So, yeah, 
That's a program that's. that's um, but I think it shows a nice balance good. between the sciences as well as the arts and the program that you're supporting. Absolutely. Another program that I forgot to mention, back to your earlier question, is we're going to try to offer a RAD for men uh, next year. We have obviously um, a RAD for females, so we, we've sent uh, two of our uh, teachers to get trained, and we're hoping to offer that class for next year. So that's another thing that we're, we're, we're trying to do to offer our, for our kids. Just came in. Do you have questions? Um, I just I saw the raw numbers on the increase, and I think I just tried to do a rough estimate, but it's 2.3 percent increase year over year. So I, li I like that part of it. So I thought it was very well thought out. <laughs> oh, you're the first one to get the compliment from the <laughs> patients tonight. Good job. Yeah, Brian, did you have questions? Sorry. I think when we Sorry. spend 10 or 15 minutes at a public meeting talking about line items of a thousand dollars, we're doing the work for the taxpayers that we're supposed to do. So I'm all good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Nice job. And our middle school just friends. Oh, just Mr. Keller is coming. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, I would uh, like to thank you uh, uh, for having me here tonight. Um, same thing as Mr. Bishop uh, said, a lot of people were involved in this. In fact, I must have gone first last year because I think he stole uh, most of my lines. <laughs> <laughs> Just the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, um, yeah, so I worked with a lot of curriculum leaders uh, at the middle school, uh, with the subject matter leaders uh, who have district responsibilities to uh, prepare this budget. Um, this was, as uh, Dr. McLeod said earlier, um, a, you know, a difficult budget process just because we met multiple times to um, get to the point where we felt like we were bringing forth a, a budget that was maintaining excellence. Um, and so it was a, a multiple uh, steps along the way. And as you heard from a teacher earlier tonight talk about um, enrollment and uh, how uh, the population of Hopkinton is increasing, um, you'll see that in the middle school, there is a, a slightly different um, view on that right now in terms of projected, uh, in terms of projected enrollment. So uh, we'll talk about that. So I will start with um, personnel. So my first request is to, as Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned earlier tonight about Mandarin Chinese. Last year we started it at grade seven. Uh, we're looking to bring that up into grade eight next year. Um, actually, um, supply, um, excuse me, demand um, was greater last year. We expected to have one section of Mandarin Chinese, and we wound up with two sections. Uh, in grade seven. So we anticipate that we'll have two sections in grade eight and, and likely have two sections in grade seven once again. Um, so increasing that position overall to a 0.8, um, but the increase then for this year would be a 0.4. Um, um, largely where we saw the um, decrease in terms of FTEs um, that went along with that increase were, with students moving over to Mandarin, Chinese were in Spanish. And so you can see there's a decrease in Spanish there that would go along with that increase in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, we've also asked for uh, an increase of, of a 0.6 campus aid. We currently have a 0.4 campus aid, so this would be bringing the campus aid to a 1.0 position. Uh, the purpose of that is to provide um, support around the building with uh, morning and afternoon bus duty, assisting with parents and visitors and entering and exiting the middle school uh, classroom coverage. Occasionally a teacher might have to leave or be coming in late because of uh, certain things, traffic or uh, an emergency appointment. And so um, having a campus aid to assist in, in those kind of emergency situations, um, we have a, a need for that. Um, you also see um, in here a decrease of 3.0 FTEs uh, at the middle school. Um, so if you look at the uh, enrollments or the projected enrollment um, for, for next year, um, we are um, looking at having 240 um, seventh graders so, um, and 299 eighth graders. And so um, in sixth grade, as you may know, we do not have foreign language. And so uh, we have 12 homeroom teachers. So essentially the kids are spread amongst 12 teachers when they're in academics. Um, and so, um, you know, this year with uh, 240 students divided amongst uh, 12 teachers, the class sizes were just uh, around 20. Uh, in seventh and eighth grade, we have foreign language on team. And so those students are divided amongst 15, uh, 15 teachers. Um, and so in terms of uh, class size, um, you know, when we looked at um, having to make some difficult choices and uh, getting to the target budget number, um, it, um, we had to make the unfortunate uh, proposal to, to reduce uh, a team and, and to go down from having six teams at the seventh and eighth grade level to having five teams between the seventh and eighth grade level. Um, 
and so that's uh, that's where you see the decrease of uh, 3.0 FTEs and uh, I'll talk briefly about that that's um, you know teaming is really important at the middle school level um, students have some um, students develop that connection with that team of teachers and the teachers really get to know the students and so um, reducing teams and, and cutting a team is not something I take lightly and I think it's uh, a difficult thing and we've worked hard to, to get to the point where to make sure that we have uh, those teams so that's not a um, not something I'm excited about presenting, but um, in, in having multiple conversations and trying to meet the budget goal, that's, that's uh, where we're at. Um, in terms of expenses, um, you know, we have 27 supply accounts. Uh, we've worked really hard to make sure that um, we're meeting, we're, we're just uh, meeting, um, meeting our, our needs and not necessarily going after wants. And so of those 27 supply accounts, eight of those are, um, are over $500. Everything else is um, um, even or under $500. So I'll just talk about a couple of the highlights. Again, I know you have the uh, executive summary in front of you. Uh, we have an increase in ELA textbooks uh, by $2,600 uh, to acquire an updated grammar program for students. Um, an increase in our general supply account um, of uh, nearly $4,000 to shift responsibility of things like pencils, highlighters, and, and glue um, to the school account and taking those off of our parent supply list. Uh, we have an increase to our guidance supply account by uh, just over $1,000 um, to um, incorporate uh, memberships to subscriptions and, and uh, associations. Uh, we, have, uh, an aged, we have aged cellos, and so we're looking to increase our music supply account to replace those very aged, and I believe Mr. Hay talked about those uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, in physical education, we're looking to increase by over $1,000 to replace uh, yoga mats that are no longer usable on purchase materials to introduce uh, new activities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you have questions? You want to start? Of course. Oh. Oh, sorry, Nancy, you go first, please. I had a question about the reduction of the teams down. Is that going to be uh, two seventh and two eighth, and then one split, or how is that going to? Um, yeah, so what we would do is, uh, what, what the, the current thinking is, is that um, we would have a team that would be split between two grade levels. So we'd have two, two teams at seventh grade, two teams at eighth grade, and then a team that would have, um, that, that would have essentially two sections in grade seven and three sections in, in grade eight. Can I piggyback on that question? No, 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 you, no, but no. How, how do you anticipate that's going to affect the class size? So it, last year it was about 20 kids per right. class, and so then in sixth grade, how do you anticipate that? So, um, so what we're looking at right now, so if you divide, yeah, yeah. I have uh, a spreadsheet that um, Dr. McLeod will send your way. Um, so basically, right now, in, in, uh, for grade six, with those numbers, um, with having 12 uh, academic teachers, class sizes are at 23.4. Excuse me, for grade seven, with 240 students divided by 12, class sizes are at 20. And at grade eight, with 299 students um, with, and divided amongst 13 teachers, the class sizes are at 23. Um, to the, with the spreadsheet that you now have in front of you, uh, I'm looking down at the second table essentially, which is the, is the, the heading is a 2018-2019 proposed budget with eight academic teams. To the immediate right, you'll see without making any staffing changes and having nine academic teams, it shows you uh, what those class sizes break out to. Uh, also running down on the left-hand side, I've taken the NESDEC enrollment numbers that we were given for the next uh, five years and, uh, and charted that out as well. Go ahead. So, um, so my questions were more around the fact that, you know, just looking at what was put out earlier, which I see is the top block and probably the first block on the spreadsheet. Um, so class grade six and eight, there's a substantial increase in the average class size from 20 um, to, you know, four students in grade six and higher, closer to five in grade eight, right? Am I reading that right? Can you say that again, Mina? I'm sorry. So grade six, right now it's 19.5, and for, the yeah. size proposed is 23.4. Okay, for next right? year, yes. For yep. next year. Um, you know, grade seven, I think it's pretty much the same, around 20, but yes. again you see that jump again in grade eight. So grade six and eight, um, you know, with the increasing class sizes, that poses a challenge for the teachers. Do you think they will be able to manage this kind of a growth? Well, 
I mean, yeah, it is a, it is a substantial difference, um, and depending on classes that come through, um, you know, that is that that's something like you know, having say twenty students in your class to twenty three students in your class. I don't think that is a substantial difference. What I think is is a substantial difference is we're looking at averages, right? And so sometimes for a variety of reasons, we might have a class size of. 17 because of a number of factors because of scheduling because you know we do have um, math leveling which means that that 17 means that they're going to go up in in another place and so um, purely looking at averages I, you know I think 23 is is pretty manageable for for teachers um, it, it, it when we get to 25 26 which sometimes happen and and and, um, and does happen uh, that's when it gets to be a little uncomfortable tight in the classroom and again, Mr. Keller, I do think a lot of thought has gone in clearly in coming up with all of this. I, I just feel like where there's a lot of pressure to meet the number, uh, the quality of education should not suffer. Mm -hmm. And likewise for our teachers, um, you know, I run a couple of classes for kids and they're much smaller. Uh, but even then, if I see a slight increase, it affects sure. um, the quality that you're able to give to the individual child. And that's where my questions were coming from. But if you say that that's manageable. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. The other thing I would just add into that, I mean, the other thing that's really important uh, at the middle school, as I mentioned earlier, is, is the teams. And so, um, you know, so you're, you know, if you look at um, having 23.4, that's, that is increasing the number of kids on a team. Uh, and you have less of an ability to uh, make connections with that with that kind of family because it just becomes a, a larger family. But um, so there's there's certainly all kinds of factors, and I think that um, as you know as was mentioned earlier by a middle school teacher uh, who presented tonight. I mean, I think that if you know if these projections are accurate, I think that this is um, this is a number that uh, could work. But I think a lot of I think there's anxiety on is, will these go up? Will these numbers go up dramatically? Um, the other question I have is, um, you know, where we are asking the athletic fees to go up from 110 to 200, we are asking the parents to give more. What is the rationale for shifting the responsibility of the general supplies from parents to school? I understand it's a small number, uh, but all these small numbers add up. And I I'll guess take that one for you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Dr. If you would like, since I asked you to do it. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it came from a place of looking at absolutely everything, and I'm glad that you raise it, um, because it demonstrates that that's exactly what we have done um, in terms of, you know, what, what are the kinds of things that, you know, are things that we've been doing, right? And so, although this is a kind of reverse because it's adding on to the budget, um, it has been very wide practice over many years, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of history behind it that I'm not fully aware of, um, that teachers are asking every teacher, you know, same class list, everybody gets the same list at the beginning of the year. Um, and for a parent with four children, and if you multiply the two boxes of pencils per child, uh, a parent is being asked to send in eight boxes of pencils. So the conversation that we had at central office was, you know, um, should that be the responsibility of a public school system to provide the basics, pencils, glue sticks, markers, post-it notes? Um, and what are the kinds of things that we should be asking of parents? Um, one of the things we talked about was, was tissue. You know, it happens to be my opinion that we should be providing tissue for children to blow their noses. Um, and I understand that there's a but. That, I mean, I understand better, just as well of all, as all of us, that we're following a budget process here, and that we can run out of supplies. And at that point, it's perfectly okay to ask for additional. Or there could be something special that a teacher does in her classroom, that or his classroom, that no other teacher does. And that might be something that they <laughs> ask of parents. Our parents are very generous and, and very supportive of what's been going on in the classroom, and certainly willing to continue to provide whatever materials are being asked of them. But the really the logic behind that request was one of what are our responsibilities as a public school system? And then they're you know, thinking about, well, can we go out to bid for some of these items and get a better, better price? Um, do we want consistency of materials across our classrooms? Um, and uh, I know that the, the class lists are very detailed and the teachers work very hard to come up with 
you know, consistency in that way as well. Um, but that is the reason that it's Mr. Keller has included it in his budget because we asked him to at central office, and you'll see it in the elementary budgets as well. I see. Um, it's not reflected in the high school budget, but um, certainly something that we're hoping and, and open and wanting to, to, that's why this is here tonight for all of you to weigh in um, in terms of whether you think this is a, this is something that should be, continued to be um, something that we do not budget for, but rather ask, continue to ask parents to provide. I guess in my mind, it's just that on one end, we are asking parents to fund some things, and and on the other, you know, uh, we are moving away from Correct. it. And that's where yeah. I was trying to um, come to yeah. terms with it. That was Again, um, I, another question I have, you brought up a very good point, which is um, also something I think of, is if there are parents who have a hardship, mm -hmm. right? Do we call that out and say, even today, uh, to say, if it's a hardship, even when we ask parents to supply it and say, if you can't make it, we are happy to do it. Always. We do that. Always. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, Kathy, I know you and I talked about this in the okay. early fall, too. It, it, the, you, you briefly highlighted it, but I think it's important for people to know. There's a fiscal argument to this in that, it, yes, we are – by putting out the supply list, we're concentrating the cost on the on the user. But if you have if you have every single parent in the third grade buy two boxes of pencils for their kid, right? So the school can get a better deal buying pencils in bulk, and eventually all I mean it's still money that's paid. The money we're talking about in this budget is still taxpayer money. Right? So there's a fiscal argument to, to doing it this way because they're not only going to be able to buy it in, in better scale, but they're also going to be able to buy it closer to the utilization of the consumables, which is if every kid brings in two pencils, two boxes of pencils, they don't go through two boxes of pencils in a year. And so those end up getting wasted somehow. So I think that there's, there's an important not just sort of taking the burden off of, um, off of the individual parents who have to spend a couple hundred dollars plus every year on these school supplies, but it also just doesn't make logical sense from a, well, like almost a supply chain perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, I, that, I think that's an important part of, of that move. I, I, I think that that one makes a lot of sense. I respectfully disagree with you, John. I think it's added work to want to bid and, you know, add to all of that. That's my personal opinion. Um, and I'm I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's true, but um, it, so it, yeah. So at the end of the day, we'll, we'll see this, obviously, as you said, in everybody's budgets. And once we get to the end of all the buildings, we'll have a better context for overall what the cost is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can probably make a more informed decision at that point. You know, ha having said that, as a parent of four children who was formerly asked to bring in eight boxes of pencils plus whatever else, you know, the first stop at the Birchman household is always our supply closet, our own supply closet. And, I, you know... I don't think I probably ever actually sent in the whole two boxes. Um, so I think people can also apply their judgment. It, 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 you know, it, you don't have to have every single school supply on day one, and you can augment if your kid runs out of pencils um, in the middle of the year. And I know we're talking about more than just pencils, but I just I would say that why don't we just table that whole conversation until we get to the end, and we'll see the broader scope of this isn't like a – First of all, for those of you in the audience, we're not making a decision on the middle school budget tonight. That's not how our process works. We are seeing individual department presentations all along the course of our budget meetings, and at the end, we vote on a comprehensive budget, and there will be things that we will take out and put in and deliberate and debate on, but just so you know, we're not going to be voting at the end of the night on pencils or teachers or anything else. Um, but I would just say, you know, philosophically, we're adding fees. We're potentially reducing staff, and we're talking about pencils, and I think we need to see the whole context before we really get down into the, into the weeds on that conversation any further than that. But are there other questions about? Yeah, I, I yeah go ahead. Um, so first of all, this spreadsheet you gave out is, is extremely helpful because I think uh, what I understand, so I mean, having been through this um, budget process six times now, I, I, I've seen you go sort of up teams, down teams, flexing to, to the, the sizes of of the classes. The, the team model is, I agree with you, it's extremely valuable, but it's also extremely difficult to, to staff on a year-to-year -year basis because it's difficult to make decisions on individual positions. They're all connected. Yes. Um, and so what, what's interesting about this is you do see, I mean, your sixth grade this year is really small, 
And so that's what's that's what's significantly reducing the the sort of the class size demand throughout the next three years. My one question about that though is as you go out to 2020, 2021, you're, you're back up in those in those higher class sizes consistently. So do you envision this reduction as sustainable or do you think that you're probably looking to go back up in a few years? So I, mean, I think, um, at, again, without, if these projected numbers stay true, I think this is at least a, I think this is possible to sustain for at least two years for, you know, 2018, 2019, and then 2019, 2020. When that small group of students uh, exits the middle school and goes to the high school, at that point, you know, when we're looking at the 2020, 2021, um, those those numbers make start to make me pretty uncomfortable. You know, with averages of of 23.6, um, and as I was saying earlier, um, again, that's just averages. We have we ha occasionally, again, for a variety of reasons, we have classes at 16, which mean that those those kids have to go somewhere, and so those other classes go up on the other end. So. I believe at present, you know, and I've had this conversation um, uh, with Dr. McLeod, I, I believe at present that w this can be sustained for the next two years. Again, I, I, it's tough to sit here and endorse it because that's not what, I, what I want, but yep. um, yeah. Um, and so it, it, you pointed out the, the, the flexing, we're looking at averages here, and I, I know this is also, I'm, I'm asking you to do a little bit probably more predictive than you can, but I'm just looking for kind of guidelines. So. You have an average, the, the number of classes greater than 24 students is two per grade level this year. Yes. And so directionally, would you anticipate that go, uh, I mean, I would think that would have to go up. Yes. Um, do you think it's going to go up significantly or? Um, I don't know. That's tough. Yeah. I, um, I was trying to figure out a way to um, come up with some kind of algorithm that would allow me to do that. But, yeah, I know. Um, I didn't make it into the Algebra 1 classes today to, to get some assistance, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I certainly think that, you know, if you look at, obviously, if you're looking at that first column, the, the, the history suggests that with class size of 20, um, we have classes of, uh, we had two classes greater than 24, so I suspect that it'll be in the five to eight range that we, that would be classes being over 24. Um, okay, thank you. The, the uh, only other question I have is not related to the, the teachers, and it probably actually has more to do with my experience driving my middle schooler to school twice this week. So the, the campus aid position. Yeah. Um, so would that provide you the ability to have somebody out there at, uh, on the drop-off side? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I want to. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, why don't you finish up if you, and then we'll. Um, I, can you share some um, new educational programs or anything that's incubating uh, that you're looking to implement in the new school uh, in the middle school? Um, so, I mean, there's a number of things, you know, we have the um, um, next generation science standards that are uh, being implemented in the middle school, and so those are some exciting things. And so tomorrow morning, um, uh, I'm meeting with our science curriculum leader, along with um, the aforementioned Doug Scott, who's the engineering uh, SML, and so we're talking about possibilities of uh, bringing science and engineering t closer together, because right now our engineering resides in our related arts world. and. How can we bridge the two so that um, it's not just now is my time to do engineering and then now is my time to take science? So um, those are some of the big pieces. Is, is talking about some of those interdisciplinary and kind of breaking down those classroom walls. Um, you know, we are proud of the uh, the progress that we've made on MCAS. We don't like that to be the end all be all because we feel like we're greater than than uh, MCAS scores. But uh, as Dr. Kavanaugh presented uh, earlier, our MCAS scores make us very proud, and so. We want to continue to be able to um, meet our students at, at, the, at the range that they're at. If those students who walk into the classroom on day one and already know the content, how are we going to enrich them? And uh, those students who are, are struggling after we've been teaching the, the content for an entire unit, how are we going to make sure that we don't just leave them behind and, and move on? So our focus has really been, um, you know, we've been working on being a school that responds to student needs, and RTI has been something we've been talking about for a while. How do we respond to intervention? How do we... Uh, help those students who are above and beyond, and how do we help those students who are struggling? So I think, I mean, um, it may not be exciting work, uh, but it is, I think, the, the most important work is, is making sure that uh, all students are walking away learning those essential standards. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to, you know, ask that, that new programs and uh, new ideas and innovation continues. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, another thing that we've talked about, I was meeting with uh, my student advisory uh, a couple days ago, um, 
and uh, Ms. Ben Bennett and Ms. Slate, the other assistant principals, were part of that conversation as well. As you know, we've looked at a variety of ways that uh, we can. Uh, we're very proud of our related arts program, and we think that is a really strong component. So we're always looking at are we making sure that our related arts program is current and, and meeting students' needs and. We've talked about, you know, the kids had a lot of ideas around like moving to more of an elective uh, model and that's been part of something that we've looked at as part of our school improvement plan, so. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. Welcome, thank you. So I want to piggyback to the class size issue just to, so I can have a clear understanding. So with the flexing, the way it goes, is, is there, and if so, what would it be, a cap be on how many kids would, under this proposed <coughs> budget, be in a particular section of either the seventh or the eighth grade? Is there a, a tight end where you say no more than 25, no more than 26? Oh, so in a class? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean. On the high end. My direction with, with you know, when um, has been that I, I, I don't like to see more than 25 in a class. So that's something that we, we've tried, we've strived not to. Now, there are definitely occasions uh, where we get to a point, particularly when we in, involves math, uh, when our higher math classes, when we're saying we're either because this many students qualified to be in our upper level math class, we either need to have two classes of 27 or three classes of um, 17. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kamenow. Um, so it, the moments like that where we, where we say, okay, in this case, I think we can go over 25 and we don't like, and we don't like to do that. But, um, but anyway, that's, uh, 25 is kind of that guidepost that, that we've had. And then this is actually not a question for you, but it's related to that. The it just for comparison, in our do, a, a, anybody know what kind of the fifth grade class is at right now? Just from looking for comparison of what right, we're going. So from. those class sizes are comparable across the elementary grades. Those are these class sizes that you're looking at right now. Um, so it's the, the 281, fifth, right? But that's, the fifth that's your is fifth grade plus. No, but so, oh, are so you looking? No, no I'm, I'm wondering. Year, no, this I'm, is this year's fifth grade. I'm, not, I'm actually wondering how many students are we putting in the fifth grade, not per year, but oh. like where, where are class sizes oh, looking oh, oh, for? Oh, oh. Um, so Sue think. is on it. Sorry, I, I, that came up in my mind as we were talking yeah. about class size yeah. and what, how much of a difference would it be? Because I'm guessing yeah. that the lower class sizes are less than what they're experiencing that they have right now this year. The 19 kids is probably less than most elementary classes. Is now that? I'm really not understanding. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 you're so, saying so, a typical fifth grade class yeah. is more than 20 kids right now. Typical. Yes. So it's not mm -hmm. such a shock to go then A from typical fifth grade class is around 22. Okay. That was my question. Is exactly. that it? Thank you. Okay. Sorry. As is the typical kindergarten or first grade class right now. Is I mean, that's the reality of what we're yeah. talking about with, with 23, 24 students in, in a classroom at the lower elementary level. So it's not a significant difference going into this newer model then is what I was getting at. I mean, it's not to where we want to be. And I no, echo, I echo Alan's, I mean, when, when I listen to him speaking about the team model, when I, when I listen to him speak about the achievement that we, um, that we all um, were applauding, six weeks ago, um, it's, it's very difficult to sit and listen to, um, you know, to the work that's been happening in terms of building this team model um, to have to start going in a different direction. It's, 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 hard to pro it's hard to propose and it's hard to think about. Um, I know that it's so much more than just class size. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, we've worked together uh, with all of the administrative team to, you know, the budget we're talking about tonight and the number that we put up there is including this reduction. So without it, we're, we're back at eight. It's gone now. I didn't want to look at it anymore. Yeah. Um, but but it, it's, it's, it is hard and it's frustrating and there is the unknown of, of students moving in, not only, as I said earlier today, not only into the classrooms, but then moving in and in addition to that needing L services. And I think mm -hmm. Alan's point about this is, this is nice and cut and dried when you look at it, but there's a very real um, change that happens when you service kids that need additional services and how that affects everybody. Um, and when he's carefully placing students, I mean, you've heard a lot about the co-teaching model at the, mm -hmm. at the middle school. That's been hugely successful. Um, and although that's a general ed teacher and a special ed teacher and doesn't affect this, um, it certainly affects the way in which we place students and the needs that they have. 
And so it's, you know, when, when we look at 22.23, and then we understand that that could mean in, in several classes, 25, 26 students, in order to have other teams that maybe have 20, um, then, then it really is. And this is where we begin. This is where we begin with projections that we're feeling pretty confident about. You know, we've, we have worked with NESDEC and we feel pretty good about those projections. And there's some flexibility in here. Um, but the concern is, will we be able to continue doing the things that we've been doing within the team model to realize the kinds of successes that they've had at the middle school mm -hmm. um, without it? And that's, that's hard. It's hard to uh, it's hard to predict. I guess. I mean, I know that they will continue to have wonderful successes, and it's a it's a proposal that is certainly on the table. Um, but hopefully, we can think of other other ways as well. And you know, again, I want to reiterate. I kept asking this of Mr. Bishop, and the same for Mr. Keller. Is I hear that the twenty five is the uncomfortable number, but I think we need to address it before we hit that number. And many times, it, you know, while you're talking about focusing in the class, uh, my personal experience has been that the kids who are meeting expectations and exceeding expectations are the ones who are at a disadvantage many times because the focus goes so much more than on the kids needing that help. So when you have those increasing class sizes, those children are at a disadvantage. So I'm just bringing that back for you to think about, and I would like personally to see that ask for the teachers or whatever it is that you need to meet every child's need at where they are, keeping the quality of education, and reduce the other things that we've to, you know, we were talking about before the slide. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, to go back, the, the teachers are such a valuable resource, too. Yeah, right. Arguably the most important resource. <clears throat> Did you have questions, Jen? I do. Uh, how, can, <coughs> how did you arrive at the three teachers? Um, and before you answer that, <laughs> the reason why I'm asking is because um, doing quick math, if, if you keep at least two of those positions, as opposed to eliminating all three, it puts the sixth grade class size roughly around 21.6 and the eighth grade class size around 21.3. Seventh grade class size would remain at 20, which as a teacher is fabulous, but from a realistic, from a fiscal perspective, I understand that's tricky. Um, but at least they would be fairly comparable, 21 point something, 20 point something. So, and, and that would save two positions. So I'm just curious, I know from, from a fiscal standpoint, three saves more money, but what, is, what else went into that decision? Uh, really just, um like, so the, the typical team structure at the middle school is, is, is at the seventh and eighth grade level is a team of five. And so it's the English, uh, Spanish, excuse me, the English science, math, um, social studies, and then foreign language teacher. Uh, whereas the sixth grade, it's all those people without the foreign language teacher. So, um, you know, we, we uh, employed a model. Um, the current uh, freshman class that uh, Mr. Bishop mentioned earlier was very large. They were over 300. Uh, I think when they left the middle school, they were at 310 or somewhere around there. So. Um, when they came into the building in grade six, um, we added two positions. That was part of my budget proposal way back then, is to add two positions. And so we had kind of a mini team, and those ki those teachers essentially followed the kids um, through the three grade levels. And although that worked, um, I, I honestly, um, you know, what I've said is we got really lucky having two teachers that were outstanding with kids that were uh, dual dual licensed. Um, so I don't think, I'm not confident that I would do that again because I, I think we got really lucky and, and, and so I, it makes me nervous thinking about a team of less than uh, four people and asking people to teach, asking people to teach out of the certification. And, I'm, and maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but I, but no, I, I think, I, so you're basically taking one teacher from sixth, one teacher from seventh, one teacher from the eighth, is that what you're? No, or I'm, I'm uh, so we have, uh, we have, right now we have nine teams. So three at grade six, three at grade seven, and three at grade eight. And so um, with the current grade six students moving into grade seven next year, um, because they're so, uh, their numbers are so low, w what I'm doing is eliminating, uh, um, one of the teams, so if I look at just seventh and eighth grade, now we're down to six teams, eliminating one of those teams and making one of the teams split between the two grade levels. So they would just be dividing up and we'd put uh, less, te less, essentially, less teachers in seventh grade, so two teachers 
and then three teachers, they would not be on the same team and they would just have to be split amongst those two grade levels. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah Sorry. Sense. That's can, I, can I clarify one thing? So you mentioned that that new freshman class was 310 students. Yes. And so effectively, from an aggregate numbers perspective, this year, the 310 class was replaced by a 234 student class. Right. Yes. So, I mean, that's a, again, I don't think anybody, I, I don't think anybody is, is happy about having this discussion, but I think that's important from a context perspective. That's a massive drop right. that you're seeing. And as you pointed out, for that 310 student class, you did add teachers Correct. in that budget. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, just to be clear, if you were not talking about reducing the three teachers, the class size that you're projecting for sixth grade next year would be the same Correct. as it is because Correct. you're not, Effect, sixth grade is not affected by this. Mm -hmm. So we're just talking about creating, going back to the split team model. Exactly. That, yes. um, back in the day <laughs> when some of us had kids in the middle school um, was, was employed. I think from my perspective, you know, we just had Mr. Bishop up here and he has so much more flexibility in terms of, you know, point two, point four, right. whatever, um, in the context of the high school schedule. I think you know, on the flip side, you have the most challenging um, schedule because of the team structure, which we all value and have invested in. Um, and so, you know, even at the elementary level where we always are adding or shifting teachers to follow the population when we have those bubble classes and, you know, that was a challenge for you as that huge class came through the middle school. And as you say, we got we got lucky, but you know, we did add staff for that ginormous class that is still there. And I don't mean to imply that those teachers aren't very <laughs> productive and busy this year, but you know, it's also it, it's so challenging to look at a class size of sixteen students. Um, but it's also, you can't just take away one teacher and fix that. So it, it, it's such a difficult mm -hmm. conversation, in particular at the middle school, which mm -hmm. I guess I'm, is obvious by now in the conversation. But um, I think for me, what would be really helpful, and maybe this is already part of what you've done, but these, these are the NASDAQ projections. Right. So I don't know how much extra homework it is, but if, if we can go back a couple of years and see, and I think even this was in the presentation, so maybe it's easy that we had from NASDAQ. So I have two requests. One is, um, I know we have it all somewhere, but if we can get the NASDAQ, the enrollment projections so we can have them in our budget book, that would be super helpful just to have them handy to refer to as part of these discussions. But secondly, I, and it might be on that chart already, but how far off they were in the middle school projections, because we, we, you know, just off the top of my head, I know they've been wildly off at the center school for the last many years, and we've had some unusual bubbles at the high school. So just before, just in terms of a comfort level, I mean, this is the last thing we ever want to do. Um, I want to make sure that we, look, you know, we're really looking beyond just what NESDEC is telling us and, and also looking at what our own experience is because just like it's, you know, the converse of it's, it's easier to absorb this kind of a change at the elementary or high school, it's also harder to correct it. If we do, did make this change, it would be very much harder to correct it next year in the context of a budget that's already voted because you're not talking about adding one teacher or like Dr. Kavanaugh, we've been able to add one ELL or possibly another ELL. We can't, so the middle school team, it, you know, we can't team. do it that way. Um, so, you know, again, for everybody that's listening, this is not a conversation, this is not um, a decision that we're making tonight. So a, a large part of this, at least for me, is what other information do we mm -hmm. need um, in order to make this decision in December in the context of everything, uh, December, January, in the context of everything else that we're gonna hear and just understanding you know, that the middle school is such a different model and nobody's advocating for undoing that <coughs> model. So um, we need to work within that context, but we also need to re be responsible to the rest of the town in terms of you know, what we're asking for. So that was probably a lot of words that didn't say a lot, but those are my two requests. Can I add on one request that I know we did look at this, but I don't have it handy. At some point to have the past maybe two years, what the number of move-ins in the seventh and eighth grade in particular have been, just to see if we can 
project because I know those are often all, throw the NASDAQ projections a little bit um, and to see how much comfort level we have and the ability to absorb that. Net movements, right? And net movements, yeah. yeah. And I lied because I now have a third request, which is also. Um, <laughs> no, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 to the point of the earlier conversation, how, how many of those kids are ELL kids, too? Because I think certainly if, if as that population is increasing, the lower class sizes are so helpful. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, that's a little different than the elementary model, um, too, and, and not probably as easily absorbed. So that would be really helpful to know. I just want to make sure we're looking at all of the data available to us before you make a decision like this or before we recommend to the town um, that that we do or we don't. Um, I do have, um, I've got a lot of helpers here tonight. Carol's <laughs> doing my math. Uh, Susan's giving me NASDAQ projections. <laughs> Are you aware I was wrong? I don't, do you want me to uh, talk about last year's NASDAQ projections and where they were? Or do you want to? Do you want to just uh, receive that? He, time? He's got it right now. Okay, sure. But uh, but I my answer is both. Okay. How about that? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so um, their projections for the current for um, the current school year were off by six. So they had us uh, the middle school enrollment at 800, and we're actually at, at, as of October 1st, our enrollment was uh, 806. Okay. Are you also able to share the breakdown, 6th, 7th, and 8th? Sure. Um, so projection for current grade 6 was 226. Actual is 234. Projection for grade 7 was 293. Actual is 295. And projection for grade 8 was 281. And actual is 277. So, so the 6th grade was where you saw the 12. Uh, yeah, it was an increase of, what, 8, right? And the it six seemed like 12 to me, but I'm yeah, uh, it was projected 226, and actual was 234. Okay, eight. And so again, the sixth grade isn't changing regardless. So yeah, right. correct. Right. Okay. So is there any other information that we're looking for to uh, when we come back to this that we want to request? So you, I, I guess, on the NASDAQ projection, and, and again, I can go to mine, but I don't know if somebody's summing it up. But if we could get a few years of that yeah. so that we can tell if, yeah. like, is sixth grade a year That's where true. we see an increase yeah. typically right. or is it, was that an anomaly? Right. Okay. And so, I, I just we'll want to uh, clarify what I was talking about earlier uh, with the school supplies. It's not about the pencils or, you know, the school supplies. It's the direction which we are trying to show where we are asking for parents to pitch in somewhere and where we are doing this. I don't, I'm not against it. Yeah. But I don't know if this is the year to do it. No, I, I get it. I just I think we'll have a more uh, comprehensive or more informed conversation about that once we see all you know the total impact at all the, the buildings. Um, do any of the three of you have questions or requests or so more information? Is more towards Susan. When I'm looking at the um, projected new salaries, they seem to be above what the sample salaries are in, in the grid that you produce. I don't know if that's just the nature of the positions because what you're listing are um, your, your teachers in a regular classroom and you kind of added different types of teachers. I'm just curious because they're all a little bit higher than what the, the um, salaries are that are listed in the grid. And so I'm, I'm not sure what you're looking at. So I'm looking at where you're showing the new personnel report request and... Yeah. And they have, they have sample salaries right here, um, but in all three presentations tonight, the position, the actual salary mark you're showing is higher than what's down here. So I'm just wondering if that that's because of the nature of the positions or if this actually isn't an accurate sample. Of no, that. so um, in some cases we're <coughs> increasing an actual person, mm -hmm. and so we're increasing where they are. So. Those salaries say, that are yep. down below is if it's somebody that's new, new yep. and we would assume that we're hiring them at that level. Okay. So when you look at the reduction, mm -hmm. when I showed the uh, reduction of three FTEs, I used that that number because you get into whole bumping right. rights and everything, so that's not an identified mm -hmm. person. So in so, that's why sometimes they differ from what you see on that grid. Good. Thank you. Do you have questions, Mike? No, I just applaud uh, Principal Keller for, I think this is another reasonable budget. 
And I do recall, was it three or four years ago when we had the bubble class going in, and I think we had this exact same conversation because how do you, especially dealing with teams, it, it's just a different beast you, you have to deal with. And it, you can't just hire one teacher or two teachers. And it was, it's the same, it was the same discussion. So. Brian? But to add on to that, and maybe from a different angle, if you can keep those three teachers if you need to if there's another class coming in right behind it. Right. That's right? What so I'm, I'm really struggling with it. I'm, I'm interested. I wonder what the numbers were class size wise in the middle school in 2010, 2011. Well, where were we in the height of the recession with, with numbers? The big class going through that year too. So we, and then that's, I think that's still that all bubble? on the NESDEC because they are still in the district, right? Mm -hmm. So we need our NESDEC spreadsheet to be in our books. Okay, it'll be I, handy. I have made so note of that. Can we, I mean, yeah. If we're going to go back to recession-like numbers in the classroom, student-teacher right. ratio numbers, and we're not in a recession, and we're growing as a community, I really struggle with that. Yeah. Right. This is me saying this. Yeah, right? I know. Pain <laughs> when it comes to Mr. 1.0. Right. Yep. So I, I think the class sizes are bigger, though. I think we're, get, we're bumping up against 25, 26 when we had the bubble moving through the middle school. And so don't, don't forget, also, size. at that time, we had the preschool in the middle school, so we also had the issue of even if we could have added more staff, we simply did not have classroom space. So there was that, that was all in that same period. So uh, we will get that NESDEC for the, for the next time. We'll get the- Or I can get it too sooner. Yeah, but I mean, we'll have it available, but- You wanna know class size in 2010-11 in those three grades, right? Well, I just, I'm interested in what the, what the class sizes were during those difficult years yeah. when we had zero or 1% or no, whatever it was, increases okay. um, because of economics. Yeah. And if we're going back to those numbers in a different economic time, I have a real problem with that. Yeah. Just philosophically. Okay. Um, so, so I, and I applaud Mr. Keller for his presentation this evening and looking at it in a very fiscally responsible manner, but we have other responsibilities to the community and obviously education I think is number one. So we have to, I'd like to look at this further with some better understanding of what it was like during a recession. Okay. We're not oh, and just, just to clarify, Mr. Keller is only making this proposal because he was asked to. <laughs> this is not his first proposal. Yeah, well, I don't put this on him. I, okay. I'm looking over there. The, the, that's <laughs> fine. And I'm looking right back. Um, because I think that we're all, we're all struggling with the same thing, Brian, right? I mean, we're working really hard and seriously to get to a number that we jointly agreed would be something to work towards. And now we're realizing that that number is, is pretty unreasonable or un, unattainable. I just want to just, though, it's important to understand our process here publicly is that we do a lot of work behind the scenes. And this is not, as, as Alan said at the beginning when he first came up here tonight, we've been back and forth several times. Um, and this was the most final rendition where we just, you know, at, said to him, class size of 15, we're going to need to, you know, how can we how can we get how can we support that in a budget that's already at 7.8 percent of an increase? So um, it's it, it was only because we asked him to, um, and because he he's working as part of a team that that he is proposing something that obviously he would rather not have to be doing. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's incumbent on us to ask all these hard questions and look at all these things. It doesn't yeah. mean that that's where we're gonna end up, but we, we have to at least understand um, what it is that we're asking. But I think, you know, Brian, to go back to what you were talking about, about those earlier budget years that were so much tighter, I mean, it's hard to wrap your head around it, but what we're looking at in a almost 7% increase is a level service budget, actually a little less than level service budget when you account for, you know, the changes in our special education, the changes in our enrollment, and the changes in our in our ELL population. Yeah. Um, it, it's really counterintuitive, but I think that that, you know, to me that's what's coming through. Um, that doesn't mean that it's easy for the town to absorb, and, and we need to have that continuing dialogue with, um, with you and all of your partners on that side of the table. But. I do really appreciate that you're here to hear, you know, be able to talk directly to our department heads and hear um, how much work is going into it because, you know, it's it's not that we're just coming asking for a big pile of money. Well, and as you said earlier today in a previous meeting, we, we had that conversation at the beginning of September. 
the yeah. conversation about the budget message and what, what we all hope to be able to achieve and work towards. And I think it's been through the work over the past many weeks mm -hmm. that um, it was probably, you know, maybe shouldn't have been too early to predict um, that we would be this far away from, from that percent increase. Um, I certainly believe that we would be closer, though, mm -hmm. back, back in September when we first began. I know some one person I'm looking at did not, but. <laughs> um, I had doubts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. All right, any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, thank you so much to all of our Sorry. administrative thank team. Thank you. Kudos to all of you for getting compliments from appropriations. Those are hard to come by. So nice work. Thank you. Not far off our schedule. We're not. Well, a little bit. Okay. So we'll get. We'll continue on. Um, we're on to liaison reports. So I'll just start. Do you have anything? Jane? I have no reports for okay. tonight, no. Nina? I do have a report. Um, Dr. McLeod and I uh, you know, had the community communications meeting. Um, it was, um, I would say we're still struggling a little bit with that and what we are trying to um, achieve there. But one thing that did come out um, was that we would like a place where we can at least work on a community calendar. That was a concrete takeaway task. Um, I am to follow up on that um, as to, you know, there, there were some uh, ideas on where it should go. So I have a follow up item um, to figure out that place and reach out to that particular person. Um, so that's something on my end. But besides that, I feel like we are still trying to figure out and, you know, with, with the diverse group that we have in there, what is it that we are looking to achieve? We did go over that, but I still felt like there's more thrashing out to be done there. Okay. John? Um, so we had a, uh, a field committee meeting um, this past Wednesday? Yeah, I when think it was it, yesterday. It was, yeah, it was yesterday. Uh, no, Tuesday. Tuesday, thank you. It didn't feel like yesterday. Um, and um, with the, uh, so we shared the CPC at the last meeting because we're having these meetings a no, lot. No, I don't oh, think we did. did. Oh. Right, sure because we haven't met since that was the two days before Thanksgiving. Oh yeah, that's right. So, so uh, the big development in that is that um, we did get the vote from the the community preservation committee to um, to fund one point seven two one point seven two million dollars mm -hmm. towards the turf field project. So, oh. significantly reducing oh, the ask that we'll have at town meeting. Um, they are, it's, it's $720,000 that they're going to bond through CPC to pay for the lights um, and a million dollars that is to be spent on whatever CPC available um, line items and we have easily a million dollars worth of those within the project. So that will reduce our ask to the town by that $1.7 million. Um, the, the bonding of the lights, I think, was partially reflective of the fact that they are also, um, they also approved the bonding of the lights for the, Fruit for Fruit Street Field. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're doing both of those, but I think that it, that's also good news because it's just a better, it, that's going to improve the utilization of the Fruit Street Fields as well. Um, so off of that, um, we, um, and we also received the approval of our notice of intent from the Conservation Commission. Um, so the project is moving right along and to that end we had two vendors come in this past Tuesday to meet with us to talk about turf. Um, so we got started to look at potential um, carpets and infills so that the committee can make a recommendation pretty soon for what we want to look at from, from the, um, the carpet and infill perspective. So there's a lot more to this than I ever imagined. We know that they've <laughs> developed a lot more past crumb rubber, but even the very, I mean, the, there's, I mean, one guy had about eight different carpets oh that he brought in, yeah. which, which can be sport dependent. Um, we'll obviously look for something that's more of a multi-use type of carpet. Um, but it's pretty exciting progress to be starting to get to that tangible place with, with the proposal. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I now know more than about single fiber, multi fiber, and thatching than I ever anticipated. I didn't know sand wasn't round. Well, <laughs> <laughs> or that it was hypothetical. Except in Texas, apparently, yes. which is where they get the stuff. Right. That was, so it's been a fascinating yeah. project, and I'll just um, add on to that that we also had a meeting yesterday with Parks and Rec. <coughs> Um, 
to continue the conversation about the joint management of the um, of our fields and how that will work and what each of our roles are. And so that, I have to say, across the board, this project has been very collaborative with all of our talent, with the Conservation Commission, the Community Preservation Committee, the, um, the Parks and Rec Department have all just been so great to work with. And I, I just think it's a great example of, I mean, this truly is something that will benefit the whole community, but everybody really is, is coming together and, and being really, um, collaborative in their approach so that's been great um, and the Gail associates will have another meeting probably before the holidays um, because Gail is getting ready to go out to bid in January so then we'll get more uh, like a final determination of what the price actually will be um, and so we'll have that in advance of town meeting and certainly there'll be more public forums but yeah just to echo what John said the project has been going really really well and and receiving a lot of broad support across the community so that's been that's been very validating so that's great job John and Jean excellent to well, get it's been a lot of people a lot of work clearly has gone into get to this place great you have any? So I do quickly. Dr. Cavanaugh and I met for the with the bullying inter prevention and intervention subcommittee that we had all uh, commissioned a few meetings back. I thought it was a very productive meeting. We broke it down into different jobs, talked about some of what we're hoping to accomplish, uh, including making it a little bit a separate part to make it more user friendly in addition to going over and making sure that we're meeting the state and the regs and regulations, sorry, the regs and whatnot um, that are required by the state. So I thought it was productive and more to come on that. So. Thank you. Um, so in terms of liaison reports, John covered the one about the field, so that's great. Um, and the, so I don't have any other liaison reports, so I'm going to move right into the chair report unless anybody is objecting. Um, so first, I just will read that I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 18-028, 18 18-029, and 18-030. All warrants have been included in your packet. And I have approved for payment the payroll warrant S180011, and all warrants have been included in your packet. Um, so my, the next item is the superintendent search. As you all know, we announced on Monday, the four finalists for um, our, super, our next superintendent of schools. Um, and we do have a page on our website dedicated to the superintendent search, um, the scheduling, the biographies of the finalists and whatnot. We will have two um, of the finalists in the district all day on Monday doing tours. They'll have, we will have an interview at six o'clock here and at seven o'clock no, not here, in the middle school. Why am I looking at you? You don't have to go. Um, in the middle school, while we are interviewing one candidate, the other will be in a public forum, and then they will swap. Um, so we will do the same thing on Wednesday. So between Monday and Wednesday, all four candidates will tour the district. They'll meet with um, people in the community. They'll have their interview with us, and they will... Um, have the opportunity to meet the public and feedback forms will be available for any members of the public that um, take the opportunity to come. So it's going very well. I have to really strongly thank um, Jen and I had the opportunity to be on the screening committee. It was a very, very good committee. I thought Susan was on it as well. And um, the process was really, I thought, quite rigorous. Um, and we, we had a great result. So we're well on our way. Um, we also need to start the process of reference checking, which of course our super, our search firm does, but historically um, the school committee has gone a little deeper than that. So you will be getting an email from Kim at some point in the next couple of days, probably with an assignment and um, some forms. So we will all, and we'll ask the administrators to help as well, but we like to, to do as deep a dive as we can um, to check references. So that, unless anybody has questions, that's my superintendent search. Can I say something real quick? Um, because Jean won't ever compliment probably anyway, herself, oh. <laughs> um, the, the entire process, you have made such an enormous difference in the process, the puzzle that you put together in order to accommodate <laughs> two candidates on Monday, two candidates on Wednesday. She spent probably 30 hours last weekend figuring out how to piece all that together. Um, so you, it, well, the nice. reason it has gone so smoothly is due in no small part to well. Jean's contributions to the whole process. Thank you. So. To be honest, I copied off somebody else's homework. Well, whatever you did, <laughs> you, did. you spent a lot of time <laughs> on it. But thank you. Back. 
It's important. It's arguably the most important thing that we do. So. So while we're complimenting Jean, there's another oh. compliment <laughs> that I do want to pass on. Uh, Mrs. Inman is still very happy that her lights oh, are off. And we discussed it again today, how happy she is and with the work that Mr. Person did. But we talked about you in particular that, you know, you had gone and taken the pictures and you were at it. Well, and sleep is important. You were instrumental in getting that fixed. So. Says one who never sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, thank you from Mrs. Inman to you. All right. Well, Just, thank you. Eunice is lovely. Yeah, point of clarification, you may have said this, but the interview that's in the middle school library and the forum that's in the auditorium will both be oh, um, thank you. taped by HCAM. They right. will be taped by HCAM, but they will not be broadcast live. They'll be broadcast after they're all concluded so that no one candidate has an advantage over another. Right. Which will allow all of us to take into consideration the public forum, which we will not be present for. Thank you. That's, that's yes. So, and anyone else that's not able to attend can see it um, as well. Okay. so. Moving right along, since we already did our superintendent's report, now we are on old business and we are finally at the conversation around the um, transportation policy. So I know a lot of our audience, we've worn them out, <laughs> um, but I would expect that we will, if they're watching at home, they will hear that their comments are being considered as we talk about um, the policy. So I'll just turn it over to you. So we didn't actually um, talk about policy. So one of the questions uh, during public comment really was asking about context. And I can understand why there was confusion because we decided at our last meeting, two meetings ago, not to even take it up. And so I'm sure for people who were listening to the discussion, um, one, of, one of our, our community members tonight who said that please provide the context, um, I'll begin there. Um, so the, the, op, the policy EEA that has been circulated through listserv is the one that has the redlined version. Um, and the reason we were bringing transportation um, to consideration is um, because there were things that had changed within it, even outside of the budget. But it was timely when we were putting together the policy calendar that we definitely wanted to bring together, bring forward a conversation about transportation early enough so that if there were changes that would be affecting daycare, this very thing that happened could happen and that there would be plenty of opportunity for public input, which is where we're at. So the, I don't think, I think I would, so not I think, I will suggest that we begin with the blue lined version um, because it incorporates any changes to the policy that we would want to recommend in addition to a new proposal that I know that you're going to want to have a chance to um, have some discussion around. Um, and so it was shared with you previously. This is not the first time you're looking at it. But if we go through it from the beginning, um, and Sue, would you like a paper copy? Does that, does that you interest yep. you? Um, the, on the first page, talking about um, Hopkinton students who attend approved regional schools. Are you following along? This is B. This is version B. Okay. So student transportation policy EEA version B. Okay. Um, Sue, can you speak to why that change is being requested? Non-resident <coughs> section 7C are provided transportation. We added the words coordination information by the Hopkins Public Schools Transportation Coordinator. Why was there a change there? It, it just really was. Um, we don't actually do the coordinate the transportation through the school department. It's actually done through the town for the vocational schools. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is where we get into the bus routes and stops, and you can see all morning and afternoon pickup and the, the piece about the five-day a week um, uh, requirement, struggling here, requirement um, has been taken out of the proposal B. Um, and instead, I would ask Sue to talk in a little bit more detail about, because it's just not really reflected here, what it would mean in terms of busing, 
transportation in, in, in the kinds of things that they've looked at in detail, like how many buses would be stopping at daycare centers, how would this affect the length of the bus route? Um, if you could speak to that in a little bit more detail, that would yeah. be great. Um, so what we did is we, we took the actual enrollment that's in the larger daycare centers now and mapped out the potential of if there is a child that is going to the larger daycares, what it would mean to actually build the daycares into those routes. Um, obviously, if there was not a child on, on a bus, you know, now, and again, we're talking about today's current database. Um, so, but we actually created mock routes. So taking those same routes and adding the daycare on there, and what would that do to time? You know, as the one parent uh, question, that right away was, was our biggest question, was whether or not we could add those daycares onto the route and what would it do to time? And could we still keep them, you know, within a reasonable time? So on average, it added about eight minutes to the route. Um, so that was reasonable in terms of, you know, all the routes still stayed within, within a, a, a good time. So then it was just, you know, all right, so then what does it look like um, because you can't have all 26 buses showing up there at the same time. So some, what does it look like if we put some of the buses getting there in the beginning, some of them getting there in the middle, some of them getting there at the end. And so we kept playing around and basically what we came to the conclusion is it is doable. So for the 200 kids, which really was a lot of the impetus for the um, really looking at this, for the 200 kids that change buses, they now would stay on their home bus. So their home bus would now consist of, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if they're going to childcare, that same bus takes them to childcare. The Tuesday, Thursday that they're going home, again, that same bus. So there's much less confusion at the school level. Um, when we mentioned the possibility of doing this to all the elementary principals, they're um, ecstatic um, because, you know, that changing of buses and trying to line 200 kids up and knowing which bus they're on on Monday versus Tuesday versus Wednesday, it, it's a big change. And again, it's, it's driving at the, you know, really the safety. Mm -hmm. So. So even a first grader can remember the same bus every day. That's right. right. And the driver, as I alluded to earlier, the driver knows all their, all their students, and you're all parents of young kids, and you know this. You know how much the, the, the drivers look out mm -hmm. for the kiddos. Um, so they'll know. They'll know the schedule. They'll know it's Monday, and, and Sue goes to, gets off here today, and on Tuesday she doesn't. And, um, so that, that will mean that, as you imagine, dismissal, kids will just know that they're, they're on bus two. They're on bus two every single day. Now, there are students that that would not be the case. That's true. So again, we, d we built this out really keeping in mind the larger daycares. Um, there are the, the onesie twosies throughout town, whether they're smaller daycares or just babysitters. Those kids, and I think when we counted them, it came out to be about two dozen. Those kids will indeed switch buses for those, those days that, that, that they're doing that. But it's a lot easier for three elementary schools to manage 24 children that are making a change versus 200. Mm -hmm. so. Should we keep going through the changes and then we can come back and look at the policy as a whole? Sure. Does that work for people? So the next one, the next change was simply that now that students are all eligible, um, it, the distance that an eligible student would be required to walk, um, mm -hmm. The reason that came out is did that refer only to the K-6 students, Sue? Right. Um, that, that must have been language that was left over from when you were charging within the less than two miles. So distance to a bus stop will not exceed the statutory limit of one mile. Okay, then eligible. Okay, right. Because we are still charging for students. Um, Seven through twelve. Yeah. Well, I think it's reflective too of the fact that it says students will be required to walk. <coughs> students don't necessarily walk to their right. bus stop. It's right. just right. They get a ride. the bus stop's got to be within a mile. That's it. That's true. Right. <laughs> um, bus just switching has been when you see that what's been proposed to come out under bus switching. Okay, 
so it still allows for students to be picked up at more than one residence. Um, but for safety and efficiency, students should arrive at school and leave school on the same bus as determined by their residents. That's been taken off. Where does it refer to the bus switching piece, though, Sue, in here? Oh, here we go. No day-to-day -day bus switching will be allowed. Yeah, K-5. So all that this removes is the requirement that the students arrive, ride on the same bus every day. It's not even a requirement. It's, it's a perfect <coughs> language. <'cause>, right. <laughs> yeah. so, You're right. So that is not a change. No. Right. So... The blue is the change. And I, of course, I printed it in black and white, so that's... Oh, here, Jean. No, that's great. There you go. Um, <laughs> sorry, do you want us to hold our questions to the end? No. Okay. Um, just, you know, the parent that was asking about enrichment after school, extracurricular enrichment. That wouldn't seem to That would be fly. procedural. Um, I did not understand. Yeah, you're but, right. Because this already says a bus. PTA extracurricular, I think yeah. she was talking yeah. about. They, right. don't, she was. they don't get on a bus. They don't. It's in the building. It's, it's, right. Yeah, they don't get on a bus. They, no, they just, I, yeah. I, I don't know whether there was a sit. Now, don't forget we had students being bused from Center to Elmwood for daycare purposes. But she didn't mean that. She meant. No, it, I, I realize, I didn't know okay. whether because there was a bus going anyway, if there was an arrangement that her child uh, got on that. I, I don't but know. But I think for all of the HBTA enrichment, they're building specific, that if you yeah, go to yeah. Hopkins, oh, your okay. enrichment is at Hopkins. Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. certainly, yeah, if, if you are attending the YMCA or the um, at-school daycare, whatever that might be, right. um, we will continue to transport students from the marathon to the Hopkins, I think, is what it's going to be. Well, it, the, the, the after-school care program, the proposal is for it to be at Marathon, which I think we've talked about a little bit. Um, as opposed to Elmwood. Okay. So it would be at Marathon and Hopkins. But the enrichment question is is right. Students go home and then they then they find their way to enrichment. Wherever. They don't go home. They just stay after. It at their own school. A, it requires a note. So okay. It, there you go. Yeah. It, oh, but it so doesn't. Sorry, it doesn't require. It does not require. A, it requires one note at the, at the beginning, beginning of the of the, the, the extracurricular term. And then the they parent. Don't, so she was asking about. Did, did she need to send a? Well, she, she needs to send a note for home. Okay. Uh, a note from home if little Johnny takes art after school on Mondays at Elmwood he can still do that the one note goes in at the beginning of that class and for whatever eight weeks every Monday Johnny goes over to the art class so that, that right. this, so there's this will no not, change this will not that. impact that at all they okay, go to art class in their own, in their own school building. it doesn't right. affect busing right. and then yeah. the parent picks them up I at think the her end question of the was okay. can they no longer send the note to have the child stay after school okay. for that so that's I, if, not if that was not her question then hopefully she'll email us but that hasn't changed it's not changed and we don't after those enrichment programs say for example it's at Elmwood but the the after school care right now is at Ch at um, I'm sorry. Say the enrichment is a different school, but the after school care is at Elmwood. They don't get no bust bus then to Elmwood, right? Elmwood. That no. doesn't happen. Okay, so no parents are responsible to pick okay. up after yeah, yeah. enrichment okay. programs. So that's no change. There's no change, okay. so that and it has okay. no effect okay. from okay. the policy. So the okay. bus switching that's been in place in the past and has been not a problem has been very effective. Um, that is currently in policy. There's no recommendation to make any changes there. Uh, for either K-5 or 612, but they're either in the red or the blue version. <laughs> Under transportation to and from child care locations. So parent guardians may request one additional morning pickup location and or, and or one additional afternoon drop-off location. We took out on a current route and, and included in lieu of their home location. Okay? We'll get to... Um, We'll get to familial sitters in a minute, so we can talk about that too. Students will be dropped off or picked up, I'm reading for the sake of, of the recording, at the closest established stop when requests for pickup or drop off locations are different from the home address. So this I have a question about, mm -hmm. because now that they're just riding on their, you know, I'll, I'll pick on bus 16 because that's the sure. bus my kids rode and Helen is wonderful if she's watching. She is. Um, so <laughs> the way I understood the first part of the conversation, my kids, if they are doing daycare, either full-time or part-time, they're going to always ride bus 16. And between them and me and Helen, they know they're going to get off mm -hmm. on Tuesdays at Kidsboro or mm -hmm. Wednesdays at home. Oh, and the teacher. And the teacher. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But so, so then... It seems like now we're also adding an additional option 
that they can request two buses in this. Re request an additional morning pickup location, an additional afternoon drop-off location, which I thought. So that it, basically this is what allows them the to say dozen? for the two, okay. two, two places. Okay. You know, so even though for the majority of kids it will okay. not change their bus, we're allowing them to say okay. and allowing so parents have that flexibility that they need Monday, Wednesday, Friday okay. is child care, Tuesday, Thursday is home. Okay, so this is more likely the two dozen ish that you're talking Correct. about that, that need this. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. So from an operational standpoint, so this allows parents to designate where their children go. Right. So we're not from an operational for them. standpoint, we will design the routes accordingly. Got that it. keeps the majority of kids on their home bus. Okay. Good luck with Makes that. Makes sense? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry, go ahead. Further, the district will plan routes to include stops at all licensed child care operators in Hopkinton who contract with Hopkinton Public Schools for busing services. That is something that the district, operationally, the transportation department reaches out to um, and, uh, and, and reaches out to those daycare locations that they are currently contracted with. So they remind that they don't just wait for them to come to us. We go to them, we reach out to them to renew the contract each year. The only difference would be if there was a new daycare in town, they would need to contact the school department in order to be able to, we wouldn't know that they were there, that, that they were there otherwise. Um, and we would contract with them in order to be able to include them in the bus arrangements. And the contracting process is, at, is in existence today? Correct. It is. So this is, again, not, not a change? Not a change. Nope. Uh, the change would be, the first part, was that, had that been added in initially about the residential area? See how it's been taken out? Because we are already establishing that they can choose different drop-off locations, that's somewhat redundant because we're, this is basically saying they can have a different drop-off location other than their home. Yeah. We've already said that. Okay. And then the next section, um, the recommendation is that the whole next, se next section come out of policy. The details as to when the dates would be really we believe is that's all that's all, all procedural yeah. and it should be within um move to the the handbook mm -hmm. is that what we said it's Include a procedural under the reference yeah the procedural reference yep. um so all that follows except and i want to call out the familial sitter the familial sitters um because i for one felt very strongly about this one um it felt to really disadvantage to me disadvantaged families um who do not have the advantage of having um, relatives in, 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 in town. Um, and it, we did, we were faced with a situation this year where the um, transportation had been arranged by the parent. Um, and the details don't really matter except that the fact that things had to change and um, the arrangements had been made with a neighbor. Now we know that this happens across town. Of course it does. We don't. They don't check in with us to let us know that their child is going to be going to the neighbor in the morning, and then together they're going to go to the bus stop. Um, I quite honestly don't think that's our business. Our business is to make sure that kids get safely from the bus stop to school, and then back to the bus stop or the daycare, or the home if they're in kindergarten. So um, it seemed that it was an overly um, involved part of our policy where we were involving ourselves in making decisions that should be decisions that are made by families and what um, what the policy was meant to do was to differentiate between a licensed daycare so you had to either be licensed or you had to be related um, and so our suggestion is that this just come out in the case of familial sitters parents must register these locations with the transportation department the policy itself, the way it's described, allows the parent to make those decisions for their child, which I believe is the way it should be. And if they are telling the school, we want you to drop our child off at this location, and maybe it's not a daycare, maybe it's a babysitter. 
then those are arrangements that, that the policy, the way it's written or recommended to be written, would allow families to do without this stipulation included. So that's why that's recommended to come out as well. Okay. Um, did you want to add to that? No, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and then under the last section, do you want to speak to that? The bus stop change request. Yeah, so the bus stop change request, basically what we want to be able to do is be responsive to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just laughing because you turned like that entire paragraph into ten words. I love it. All right. <laughs> yeah, it, you know it's it's extraordinary how many bus stop change requests we get, and it's not just in the beginning of the year. We still are getting them, so it's it's almost Christmas, and we're still being requested to change bus stops. So this is a process that goes on constantly. So to put those, you know, every two weeks you know, deadlines, you know, the bottom line, we, we, what we want um, all parents to know is that we hear you and that we will get back to you as soon as possible. And then sometimes the response is going to be, I've received your request and I will review it and get to it as soon as possible. But there's a huge queue, if you will. So that's why we tried to just really simplify this and just let people know that, you know, we do work on it as fast as possible, but sometimes you will be notified that we're working on it, and, and that's, you know, as fast as we can go. We share some cost um, associated with this and the timing impact overall. Can you share some of that, please? So this is why, from the very beginning, I did not take a, a, a bus out saying that we would be able to save a bus even with going to the five day a week. The five day a week was the only way you could have a potential to save the bus, but we would have had to do what we did. Um, so by building the, the child care routes or stops on each route and adding the you know, couple minutes to each route, you will not be cutting a bus you know, to, to be able to implement this. But what this does allow is it, it enhances really, it's, it gets at the safety of the children, which was kind of the beginning of what this conversation was. You know, the, the fact that you had so many children on multiple different changes, you know, during the week. This gets at that. They're getting on the same bus every single day. You know, it's, it's ease of the schools. Um, the principals are very grateful to be able to have this process. It does not add a lot of time to the to the busing. You've added that safety net in for children. They're getting on the same bus. The driver knows them, will know their schedules. Um, it does not allow you to cut a bus. We did not make that assumption that we could cut a bus. So this is not adding into the budget. Um, so that's that's the good news. We're not asking parents to, you know, I think there was some conversation about some fees that is not the proposal here the, pol the, po the policy doesn't drive fees so you know what you're looking at tonight really is only the policy part of the the budget discussion which is what we were doing earlier you could propose in trying to get down more on that 7.9 percent increasing a bus fee but that's not what this conversation is policy doesn't drive your bus fees now, in terms of um, the timing, um, you know, the kids who get on the bus last and the kids who get on the bus first thing in the morning, um, how would their timings change? Can you speak to that a little bit? So, for instance, if it's, uh, say, a kindergartner who gets off the bus at 3.53, right? the school gets off at 3.15 and they get off at, let's say, 3.55, just to keep it even like that. What would that look like now? So again, it you know, on average, it would be eight minutes. Uh, what is the maximum? The average is eight, I understand. But what would be the maximum change possible? Well, so again, we're looking at mock routes. So we're looking to always keep all the routes as equal as possible in terms of time. Uh, keep in mind that the busing time between the schools, just going between Marathon and Elmwood, is 20 minutes of any route to begin with. Um, 
So Should before the that? buses even start on the road, right. on their actual route, That's right. sometimes kids are on just just making that cross right That's there. Right. Just So what you mean to say is after picking up the kids from Elmwood and then getting the kids on center school on the bus, that itself is 20 minutes is what right. you're saying. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so, so you're saying there's that's still in the bus. Sorry, Mina. There's also a regulation that students cannot ride beyond a certain number. Beyond of an hour. Oh, it's an hour. Uh, the reason, so a couple of things that come to my mind. The first thing, uh, in terms of the context, I think you set that off by saying that the main concern was the safety and the operational challenges that the principals and the school was facing. And I go back to what Dr. McLeod had told me. We are in the business of educating the kids, and that's what we want our staff to be focused on. Um, so it, so that's, am I understanding that right, that safety was the main concern? Um, and that the monetary aspect of it is because of the timing, that's the reason why you wanted to bring that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say that? Well, the, the, the timing of the policy really was if we were to make any changes that had any effect on families' choices for childcare. Not really so much the budget, okay. but we wanted families to be able to, because a lot of times people are making childcare arrangements by January. Sure. Okay. So if this policy had any effect on families one way or another, we wanted to be way out in front so families had plenty of time to plan what their choices or what they were doing for child care. That's very helpful, Susan. Um, so back to the timing aspect of it, um, you're saying it's still not clear. So for in, one of the things I want to keep in mind is my child is the last to get off the bus. And there are days that I end up sending a note when he signed up for certain classes at certain time because by the time he comes home, I, it's too late for me to take him to a class, right? So that causes more notes from home. So if we have that additional where eight minutes is the average, if the maximum ends up being 15 minutes, would we be in that situation where we have more notes from home? So just throwing it out there as something to consider. Um, and also that larger issue that the pair, uh, the principals talked about, Mrs. Carver in particular, with the notes from home being 77 on a particular day, um, I would I know it's not part of the policy, but something to be addressed as well, and keep that in consideration. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is the traffic, right? I think one of the parents was talking about what would it look like if a lot of the buses stopped at you know, we're going to these mm -hmm. different locations, how would that look like? So again, we would spread the buses out. Um, okay. So we know how many buses can pull in front of Kidsboro. We know how many buses can pull in front of TLC. Yeah. Um, you, you know, so if, if only, say, three buses can fit in the front, we're not going to have a route, you know, where 10 buses are there at the same time. So we're going, that will be spreading the, the stops out along the routes based on knowing how many buses are going to be at those sites at the same time. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to throw some of these thoughts out Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. as a parent and just hearing the things that we were hearing. It, that's always very helpful because it's hard to think of every perspective when you're looking at something like this. And clearly, you know, tonight is a, a whole different way of looking at a potential solution. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have questions? Um, I just wanted to, to I, so I don't have, have any questions that haven't been addressed, um, but a, <coughs> a, a thank you to, to both of you and Ms. Fitzpatrick. I mean, the, you were, we kind of put a big challenge in front of you after the, the last meeting, and I think this is a, a very effective and creative solution. Um, one of the, I want to uh, just make sure we do our best to, to address all of the public comment questions that were raised. And right. one of the, the questions that came up was um, somebody asked why, and I know we, we talked about some of the reasons, but why are we bringing up the transportation policy? And I just, I, I think it's important to frame it a little bit. Um, I, I looked at the bottom of the, of the policy, and this will be the um, fourth time that this policy has been amended since I've been on the school committee. 
Um, transportation is the, probably it's the single biggest operational thing that the school district does on a daily basis in terms of the safety and security of children. And I, I, Nancy, let me borrow her book. It, it's regular day transportation is going to be an almost two million dollar line item in um, in our budget this year. So I, I guess my message to the the community is, I mean, that's four amendments, and we've looked at it more than that and haven't amended it. So we're pretty much looking at this every year. Um, and so a, a, as we get towards, you know, I think it's something if people are very interested that you want to pay attention to because it is a major driver for us from both an operational safety and budget perspective. So this is, this is a rare policy that we're going to really be looking at, that we really will look at on a regular basis. So there isn't necessarily a big driver that says we've got to unearth the transportation policy and get working on it. This is, I think this is one of the important things that we do every year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's true. yeah. So good segue. Here's a question. <laughs> so is, this affects approximately 200 kids in terms of the daycare situation, right? Is that the number? Okay. Do you know, and if you don't, this can be enough for another time, roughly how many kids ride the bus on a, how many actual seats are filled? And if you don't know the answer, I can totally understand you not having that answer in front of you. She has a way of helping I know. Or amazing. she will just, her fingers will fly and she'll find the answer. Talk amongst yourself. Keep talking. Okay, so oh, the I'm, 200 I'm students average per day, not 200 students that total, that attend daycare. Okay, so it's just right. every day. It could be. Right. Okay, I get so it. So yep. because we have. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yes. Tuesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because as we look to budgets, and I, I mean, I. I love that the, the vibe is but no one wants to increase fees, and I think that's great. But if we're looking at, you know, 5% of the bus riding population getting this awesome flexibility at the expense of the other 95%, I think we have to consider it. I'm not suggesting it one way or the other, but I was just curious how much of yeah. this, how big of a population this affects. And if it's a majority, great, then it is what it is. But mm -hmm. We used to do that, by the way. What's that? We used to have a fee for this. Right, and, you, and when we got rid of it? Daycare for daycare transportation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? It was 100 what, bucks. Yeah, so it wasn't a lot, yeah. It was assessed to the daycare facilities, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, we, we, so it, yeah. it used to be assessed to the individuals, then we switched it to assess to the daycare facility, but that was sort of a shell game because pretty much all the daycare facilities just increased their fee by $100. And $100 is, is kind of like a drop in the bucket when it's 180 grand to float yes, the but, extra but, buses. But so. is it 180? I don't think I got that sense that it's 180. Well, three buses was the sort of average, right? I mean, I don't, I didn't hear that. Is that right, Susan? It's sixty thousand dollars a bus. Yeah. Um, but I thought the overall saving was off a bus, is how I understood it. You would only be able to potentially save a bus if you did not allow mm -hmm. changes, which we've heard from the community that that is an unworkable s situation. Yeah, so that's their question is: Are they talking how many the difference buses? of one bus at sixty or three buses at one eighty? I think with the, you would only probably be able to look at one bus, but if you took the simple math of two hundred kids, right. right, it's three buses. That's but right. we wouldn't do that, right? But you're right. not going to be cutting three buses. That's right. So it's no, sixty it's grand is what we are talking about. Right, but in terms of two hundred kids having two seats. Mm -hmm. That's three buses. But, I see. but now they're not. That's what I had. And, and maybe I'm not doing the math right, but how, did you it find is. a number? No, so, I actually don't right. have it. So I thought it I did. I'm sorry. It is. That's all right. Yep. To that's me, all right. But to it's just me, a the trade-off is, you know, where formerly they had seats, they potentially had, kids who were in part-time daycare had a seat on two buses because the seat has to be available even if... In two places. Right. So... The way to eliminate that was the first pass of this, which is just not tenable for families, particularly Absolutely. with the construction of our district. But the flip side is, to go back to Mina's point about the travel times, you, you really don't want to eliminate that bus because if you're going to add the extra stop, you want the flexibility to almost to reduce the number of kids, I would assume, on the buses so that it's easier to absorb 
the extra stop at the daycare so that they're not on the bus for a, an unduly long extra amount of time. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, everything that we're doing, um, we're increasing the capacity of the buses when we, when we do our bus bid. So you'll be able to put more kids on a bus. So if we have still increased enrollment, now we still have capacity. So I'm sure that in the fall or the late summer, when all of your bus routes are done, if you magically find that we don't need one, we'll be happy to hear that we have realized that savings right. in the fall. But there's no way to know that right now. Well, and like I said, I mean, we took the existing population. Right. We built the routes, adding the daycare in, and it works, and it stays within the time constraints, and you cannot cut a bus. Right. Does that answer your questions mostly? Yeah. Or yeah. Anybody? I mean, it was more just thinking ahead as as far as yeah. ways to def if there were ways to defray them millions of dollars that go into the transportation costs but this was this is all I mean super creative outside the box thinking in order to come yeah. up with a plan I, like I this, don't so. think it you know as Jean had said earlier we're going to come back to the discussion about yeah. um, many many things in the budget overall and um, one of the things that we talked about at the meeting with the daycare providers and a, and a comment that I heard or read um, in many of the uh, the emails that that Jean received um, was that people would un would understand and be willing to pay a fee in order to maintain right. this service? If that's what it was going to take, you know, that would be something that they wanted us to consider. Right. So I think as we continue to deliberate the budget, we shouldn't forget that um, even outside of this discussion tonight about policy, whether or not that's a place where we could also um, come back to discuss about uh, defraying cost. I do agree because. If you, if you can eliminate the cost of one bus, you yeah. could keep a teacher. It, that is it's very going to work out to be like a $300. No, it's exactly the kid. same. You know, it's money. close. It, not exact, it's but right. close. But, but yeah. it would be to make the oh, I see. daycare. To make, to make to, the money to reduce, work. To make them, it to would be the bus either program. instituting yeah. a district-wide bus policy for everybody who lives outside of that, or inside, inside. the two-mile thing, which we finally got rid of and John's there already were, hard now a lot on of that. Feeling. I have a lot of feelings on that yeah. myself just in fees in general but the it without increasing it that broadly it's looking to take $60,000 out of the budget it would be a $300 per daycare of those 200 daycare spots. So I'm not sure that 200 is the right number and we keep that using might just it. be yeah. per day. I, I think that we need to yeah. okay. make sure that total we're students. talking because we're, we're not I, I mean was thinking I, total students. I, wasn't I remember thinking. Um, one of the daycares and I'm not going to start saying individual names of daycares on, on the on on at the meeting but uh, one of them I, I'm quite sure they said 150 students in total in total and that's only one daycare in our town so you think maybe so it's what, more than 200 yes okay. i do well yeah. so it's students in total might include five day kids too there there's yes two, it does yeah. but okay. but then right. there are so children think, who go I, to private daycare i think what we're getting i think we're getting at is for future meeting discussions yeah. can we right. zero that's in on that number yeah i think yeah. there's okay. more than 200 children in our town that that access daycare well, because there's, 300 there, seems there, like a lot right. to there's there are there are 300 students that use daycare 200 go Part less time. than five days a week. Okay, and that's, so that's, that's where the so 200 probably came more from. Go full time than part time. So is that that's a I, and the number is a okay. weird number because it's not but 200 a day. All right, so I'm going to just politely say that that's no, more about the budget, yeah. and right yeah. now we're going to talk okay. about policy. Sorry, so, to even no, that's okay. Get that so going. I'm going to bring us back to to policy, and I want to make sure to I think one of the other comment that was or question that was asked tonight was about the meeting that we had with the daycare, um, and so just as a recap to the person's questions um, actually any an open meeting. any any member of the public that wanted to attend that reached out to us absolutely was invited to attend we had at least one person if I remember correctly and he did take notes and send them out we had um, all, all of the Maybe larger daycares Facebook. were there mm -hmm. represented and I think you already reported on this it really was a great meeting it was helpful for me particularly to understand how the logistics work on their end. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of conversation around, um, you know, um, gathering all of the students 
for, for one particular daycare in one particular room, similar to the way that they nece necessarily do it for the Y because they uh, transport them on one of our buses. We had conversations around a daycare specific bus, which was gonna be also very expensive, but they were really helpful um, in terms of sharing their ex experience both within Hopkinton and in other districts that they serve or that their companies serve. So it was a really, I thought, informative discussion. And I, and what I want to bring that back to is to say that then after that, you know, you all clearly listened to all the emails that we were getting, the feedback from the daycare, the concerns of the administrators. And, you know, to echo what Jen said, this was something that I did not even conceive of that right. we could do. And to me, you know, we will see the impact on the amount of time that the kids are on the bus, but out of all of the very challenging things that we're wrestling with, this seems to me to be the safest option. And there may be a little, a few extra minutes on the bus, but I think that that's worth the trade-off of so much less chaos in the schools, so much more confidence that the kids are, it's so much more consistent. We talk all the time about how transitions are difficult for children, and mm -hmm. our littlest kids are making multiple transitions in the week. And, and as they get into it, they, they get accustomed to it, and they certainly can manage it. But this is just so much easier for the bus drivers, the daycares, the teachers, the families to, to manage the consistency. And I also think that it addresses the other critical piece that we've been concerned about since in every one of those four revisions that John mentioned um, that I've been sitting here for is that lost time on learning at the end of the day. And if you are if you know you are always going at <coughs> 16, you're not having that conversation with your teacher and you're not mm -hmm. in your line for bus 16 and seeing your buddy on bus five that you sometimes go on bus five and as you said, kind of migrating over there. So that's a very long-winded recap of that meeting and also just a thank you I think that this is a very difficult, if this was an easy solution, we would have arrived at it four iterations ago. And so, you know, as, as our community continues to grow and expand, we have to keep looking at this. And, and I guess the answer to the person's question is our number one concern and why we bring this back is student safety. And um, that's why the administrators brought it forward again. So I think this is the safest option that I've seen in my nine years on the school committee. I think it's worth a shot. We can have a separate discussion about bus fees when we talk again about the budget, but I think the remaining question now before us is, are we ready to vote on this tonight or do we want to, um, I don't, I didn't hear anybody asking for changes necessarily, but I also feel like this has, you know, there's been a lot of public engagement and it may be worth sending a, non-redlined version, final version, out one more time and just seeing if we get any more feedback and then with the expectation that we'll vote at our next meeting. So just want a read of the committee I, I, on. I think so. I was, I was sitting here kind of balancing the idea of can we get certainty around it since we're, you know, by, by voting on it. But I, I agree with you. I think that there's been so much community input that it doesn't hurt to leave it out there for one. But I think we should definitely have it on the next meeting agenda to vote yeah. this thing. And, and hope that it would be a fast, um, it, it, with the expectation would be that this has met a number of needs for both the district and for parents, and the hope would be that the feedback would not be a total rewrite in people's opinion. Uh, so to quickly do it, but also to give people, it, this is a drastically different idea than the one that we had discussed. and to give mm -hmm. people a chance to weigh in on it. So I, I have one request. It's not too much to do. Just looking at the school bus timings on, on the website, it looks like bus 14, this is for the center in Elmwood, um, that starts picking up kids at 8.05, which seems to be the earliest in that group. And it, in fact, that's the bus that does the last drop off also at 4 p.m. So if we can have just one bus route based on the current situation where we are, I know we can't project next year, what would that look like? Just that one example, I think that'll help 
a lot to get a perspective or if there is any other example where there the maximum number of changes in the current situation or maximum number of drop offs or what have you just having that example i think that will go a long way in uh, you want a sample it. bus route yes of, one sample of one the of change. the ones that okay. would be a potential and then I think the final piece just around the bus notes and bus changes and all that is really not a policy, not not in the policy. That's a procedural thing, and that's something that the school administrators are working on improving. I mean, we've certainly learned that we could do that better ourselves, and so that's something that they're that they're working and on. And they so really and they really um, appreciate your support in that regard. You know, we met this week. Um, and I said, this is something that everyone is paying attention to right now and expecting a change around notes from home. And you absolutely have the support of the school committee um, in terms of, you know, in fact, I think the original recommendation came from one of you around why don't you back up the cutoff? You know, instead of, instead of it being 2 o'clock, what about if it were 11 o'clock? So... Um, they appreciate the support. They wanted some time to really think it through, um, and because what what they're hoping to provide is something consistent, so that a parent doesn't have to remember, oh, what's the cutoff at Center and what's the cutoff at Hopkins? Same thing everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're agreed that we will put this on for a third reading at our next meeting, and we'll just ask that the cleaned up version get circulated by both serve before that. Okay. So, we are on Old Business B, Overnight Travel Request. Dr. McLeod. Just catching up. Yep, that's okay. Here we, we go. Notes. Yep. Um, yes, this is um, a final approval for a field trip overnight, field trip to France that was approved by the school committee last winter. So, you can expect again in February that you will get some intents to travel um, and it's always very exciting to see what's going to come before you at, um, each year we know that one is coming for China but not for two it's not for two years but mm -hmm. she wanted to make sure that parents knew it was going to be one of the ones because it's going to be very expensive um, so this was one that was approved the intent was approved the way that we do this for the benefit of Jen and Mina is that the intents come before you with the idea that they want to generate if there's even any interest before they go into all of the work of preparing it, but they also are seeking school committee approval um, in, in spirit. In this particular case there, it also involves something that we haven't had before, which, which is an exchange component and a pen pal, which has been taking place this year. So there's been a pen pal going on back and forth. Um, we hadn't done an exchange before, and so this is the first time, um, and all of those details were discussed. It's hard to remember all of this when they come before us, but I did check with Evan. I said, did we go through all of that this last year? And he said yes. Um, so it'll be fun to have the students come back our way. And I can't remember the timing about when they're actually coming here. I think it might be the following October or something. That's very cool. I can't cool. remember. I hope, um, well, I won't be on the school committee, but I hope they come. <laughs> yeah, to, to school <laughs> committee. I'll, send you a special I'll watch. Invitation. So typically, and I'm just saying, obviously if there's questions, typically the overnight travel when it's the final request, um, it, you know, is typically pretty pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I, I, will, I told Evan that I would entertain any questions since I was there for the original. Every time I see these field trips, I want to go there. I know. I know. I know. So I'm very excited that we are offering all of this. And yeah. Yeah. All right. It seems like we're ready for a vote. So I'm just looking for a motion to approve the request for overnight travel, <laughs> final approval for France from April 13th, 2018 to April 22nd, 2018. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, so a motion by Nancy, a second by Mina. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? So that is approved. Yay. Um, the capital budget revision, I now see that I could have found the answer to my own question earlier. Sorry. <laughs> um, are you going to walk us through this or Susan? Susan is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the um, athletic department operating budget that was presented uh, two weeks ago by Ms. King, um, that request included $33,000 for AEDs, and the thought was that that would be for 
the coaches and then it would be shared season by season so it would be that would outfit the fall coaching staff it would then go to the winter staff and then go to the spring staff um, since it is a one-time purchase and since we are faced with um, very tight budget constraints thought that it was appropriate to try to pull this out and add it to our capital request for this year so this memo is increasing the amount of your capital request to five million one oh eight three six five and again this does include the turf fields which we now know you know will be a combination of CPC and, and town meeting mm -hmm. um, so but this adds that the, those AEDs onto your original capital request so would this amount now come down, the amount requested from 3.82? It, no. It, yeah, it, it, we probably have to put it in as 3.8 with the notation that it would potentially be offset by CPC funds because we have to vote the CPC funds at the same town meeting as this is going to be on the warrant. So it'll probably be, it, it's sort of like the school. It'll be written for the total exactly. amount, but then it'll be less funding provided by. So in the motion at town meeting, it will reflect the offset, and so the taxpayers will know they're not voting the entire amount to come out of their taxes, but historically, we, as John said, the entire project budget is what's in the article. Um, that's a good move. So do we want to keep it separately or combine it with our security safety? So I saw it as safety and security on the on the agenda, but we have our warrant article and security upgrades. So I think we're I I would prefer to keep it separate okay. because I think it looks like we're it, to me it looks like we're hiding it. Okay. If we try to stuff it in there. I agree with John. All right. So I think I hear someone formulating a motion to approve the addition <laughs> of thirty three thousand um, dollar oh, okay of a $33,000 capital article for AEDs um, on the FY19 capital request. So moved. Second. Sorry. Okay, and Didn't catch that's that. okay. And a second was Nancy. Um, all in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstain? So, woo -hoo. We're moving right along. Um, yes, so <laughs> um, now we're on new business, this 2018-2019 school calendar. New business at 1046. Yeah. Well, we, we put I new know. business <laughs> first so people can hear about the best policy. I did for you. Okay. Nothing, nothing of substance, just, just a, 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 a yellow square that was in the wrong spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this is also it's a, it's for okay. everybody you, you asked for copies. It's okay. I don't even know which. I don't even know which. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're short a copy. That's, that's okay. I know. I'm sorry. The, the yellows release. are the early releases. Did you want this, John? This is that's challenging. Did you each get one? Did, was I short one? We can share. Yeah, that's okay. We're fine. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Everything was great. So radar is this new... This was the slide that was Karen's slide from oh, the yeah, presentation. Yeah, from yep. Yep. The only reason I'm handing it out is because you had asked for copies. I think you wanted it electronically, but we took you literally, and you now <laughs> I like you, old school. You, I'm good. you now have a copy. Um, so each year that I've been here, we've um, you know we've learned a little bit more about the calendar, and one thing that we learned last year was that we really ought to bring it to you sooner. Um, parents, th there's no reason not to. It's pretty clear. This year was very straightforward um, in terms of just the way it fell with 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 different days, um, uh, different vacation weeks, and different holidays. So what you can see in the calendar is the start date, really consistent with the way we did it this year. Um, we are recommending two professional development days. Oh, by the way, this has gone to admin council where we discussed it at length, and there was you know. 
it, a lot of attention made to it. So this comes with the um, approval of or under, you know, they're in agreement with this recommendation. Um, they really value the two days of professional development time at the beginning of the year. So just like this year, it would be two days of professional development. Everything, uh, classes begin on the 29th for students K through first grade and grades 1 through 12. Uh, with kindergarten and pre-K beginning on the 30th just for one day to get themselves acclimated to coming to school. And then the 31st contractually is a non-school day. So it just doesn't count in the 180 required days. Um, it's just a non-day on the calendar and that's why we call it out, just no school. Um, and then of course the third is Labor Day. Mm -hmm. So um, the yellow are also um, Contractual, what's not contractual is where they fall. So K-5 um, has 10 contractual days. There are addition, an, an additional five days that are for the entire district. The administrative team typically decides where they will fall with an eye to what, what they use them for. Um, the days that are in November, the three days consecutively in November, are there for parent conferences. And they really can't be touched because they're, again, contractual. Um, that's why November always is so cut up in terms of there's not one full week. Well, no, I, no there isn't. Not one full week of school at the elementary level. Um, we do have the sixth. Um, that is voting day. And so we work with the town to not have school on that day. We have school for teachers. We have a professional development day but we like to not have children, as do most districts where voting takes place in the schools. Most districts try not to hold school on voting day. So uh, initially we had um, our third professional development day of the year slated for February, um, but that we really felt that it was important not only to recognize um, the, the challenges of, of voting day, but also the administrative team really felt that having our PD days up front, um, we, get, we get the most value out of that. And that's why there's more of the uh, shorter early release days. Um, you can see them throughout the other months. Purple and yellow simply mean preschool and elementary. So purple is the color for designates um, the preschool team. And there are days in here for in February for the preschool teachers to have their conferences where there would not be any um, AM, PM preschool. I do have to state that some of this may change um, at, as a result of negotiations, and but not the start. I mean, I, I don't anticipate the start or any of those kinds of things to change, but the early release days, um, where they might fall, the numbers of them, those kinds of things that wouldn't really have a, an effect on the opening, closing, where vacation days, that none of that would be um, of concern. But we didn't want to wait until the end of negotiations to start to talk about the calendar and at least to be able to begin to circulate for families when we would be starting school. You can see that the 14th would be the projected last day of school, which is nice and neat following on a Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and then it allows for five snow days. Um, we will be piloting alternative learning days this year, potentially. And depending on how that goes, then in 1819, this could look different as well. Um, if that works well and we can have um, alternative learning days during snow days. Um, but the way it falls, it's very comfortable ending on the 21st um, of June. Remember that first year when it was yeah. 29th? Yep. Um, any questions? We have February vacation, April vacation um, highlighted here. Just the, the additional key dates. Yes. I'm not sure. Sure. The reason that they're there is because significant things happen. Like, for example, on... On December the 21st, it's an early dismissal day. Okay. Um, oh, yes, I want to I want to point something out. So last day, sorry, that's not true. It's simply the last day. The early dismissal days are the no, the the last day of school and the day before Thanksgiving. Those are early dismissal. What we are proposing, and this is a big change, um, we're proposing it as you see at the bottom of the calendar that early dismissal will follow the early release schedule. 
So right now, we have two different schedules for parents to keep track of, whether it's early release or early dismissal. Yes. Um, sometimes they get lunch, sometimes they don't get lunch. Um, I, particularly on the early dismissal days, no lunch is served, am I right? Right. Yes. So what we're proposing is that we still follow the early dismissal schedule on the day before Thanksgiving and on the last day of school, but that the time the times are the same as the early release. release. This is not contractual. So this is a change that we can make. Um, Why wouldn't you just call them early release? Yeah, but yeah. Because early release is contractual and it's used for professional development. It's a okay. really good question, John, and we were trying to figure out what else can we call it. Well, we were going to call it early release without PD, but it just felt like let's keep the language because the language means something to those of us who plan PD. We know it's a day that we can do something with. It's an early dismissal day for students. That's mm -hmm. what it that, is. That's good to know. We can also dismiss teachers early, mm -hmm. um, and, and typically we do. Um, but there's no reason for us to be stopping our day earlier than we have been, which for some reason we have been doing. Mm -hmm. And it, it's about a, the difference of about an hour. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's right. So yeah. are we serving lunch then? Yes. We are serving lunch. Okay. There's two more lunches that we get to sell. <laughs> <laughs> However, it's also two more days we have to be staffing right. our kitchens. So all of that will will be a wash according to Susan with her proposal with her her new proposal with with lunches but I don't know if that all makes sense to you it just mm -hmm. seemed I really was looking forward to your feedback on this one because you're all parents I, as a parent I like it because it is confusing when you get into those I, I, I always have to look it up but I it also allows those days when they're leaving particularly for the middle and high school that they get out the day before Thanksgiving at like 10.30 or something crazy like that. It almost feels like, why'd you bother to get up? It, it, to keep them another hour feels a little more meaningful. Yeah. And it did meet the requirements, the state requirements for a day on learning. It did. So we were able to do that. Um, it just didn't but seem But it was just something that, as, a, as an admin team, we thought, yeah, this would just make a lot more sense. Um, I'm going to guess it won't be popular with the kids when they figure it out. <laughs> I, I like the idea that you know what you said, Nancy, and I'm also glad that it's the later time, not the early time. Ah. <laughs> no, we did not want to lose time on early release. That yeah, definitely. So I think I think it's a yeah. great proposal. Okay, so then then to Jean's question about the green, um, those are just significant days. I don't know if it makes it more confusing for the calendar, and if it does, we don't have to do it. It was really the 29th is the first day, but not for everybody. We really want green. We want your eye to go to the list mm -hmm. in the middle and say, why is that green? Well, it's because it's first day, but not for pre-KK. Um, the 21st is just because it's the last day. Maybe that one doesn't really need to be green uh, because it's pretty self-explanatory that where you're about to begin a vacation. Again, the same thing with the second, so it's the first day back, but maybe that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, in June, it's because of the kindergarten screening, and um, but maybe it doesn't apply to enough people that really it should be highlighted on our calendar, and it may, maybe makes our calendar look a little bit. I, I actually think it's helpful. Oh. I just was, I, 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 especially I like it. Before I asked your question. I like it, uh, Dr. McLeod, especially with what you said. You know, it's forcing me to look. Okay. Like, what does this green mean? mean? That's right. Yeah. And I can see that it's confusing too, but if the idea is to make people pay attention, yeah, it's serving it, and I think it's in line with what we have for 2017-18. Yeah. It is. One. We the other thing, and that's a really good point, Mina. The the other thing about the first and the second of January is that we really wanted to point out that you don't have to come back until Wednesday, um, because it's unusual, right? The way it falls. This, I mean, it's not only Monday this year. Vacation this year includes the Monday, but next year it's you're not coming back till Wednesday. Well, Mina's happy about that. Not everybody will be. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long break this Which year. One's the, where's the one? Oh, this year. And for next year. For, for, next for year. this year, this we have Monday off, and then we're coming back on Tuesday. But for eighteen, nineteen, like a week and a half. A week and a half. 
like it. I mean, the only other thing that you could propose, and we haven't even talked about this. Well, no, you really couldn't. You, it's not as though you would come back during that week in December. Oh, gosh. That would make no sense. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Not Please, even let me retire from the school committee before. I don't want to okay. get those emails. Seriously, yeah, talk <laughs> no, about that no, next I'm going to take this up in May. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the 8th. So are we ready to uh, to vote on this, or do we I hope you are. To? Um, I mean, you don't have to be if, if we've, we've circulated with the admin team. Other years, it's come to you first, and then it's gone to them, and then it's come back to you. And I thought, why am I doing that? It really should. You want to know what they think, so I'm going to take it to them first. No significant change. I mean, the most significant change is that early dismissal to early release, but that feels more operational. I don't see why we couldn't vote it now. I, mean, I feel like we could vote it now, too. It's the alternative learning days being piloted in... 17, 18, or yes, 18, 19? Yes, the current year. Maybe, we hope, Maybe. if we can get it figured out. Um, this also in incorporates, and I should say, 180 days of instruction and 183 days um, contractually for teachers. And that's the three professional development days in red. Um, but I'm always happy. I've counted and recounted. I'm always delighted if somebody says to me, Kathy, you're off by a day. So you can... <laughs> We've, we we and, and Megan, who if you don't trust me, I know you trust her, um, this has been looked at very carefully. But even if you vote tonight and then we were to find that somewhere there's a mistake. Um, there's precedent for that? I think yeah. we've done that. Yeah. Before. Well, with all these colors, it's sometimes hard when you're counting. But yellows count. I, I trust <laughs> Megan. I mean, yes. I trust you. Yes. But, <laughs> but we especially, <laughs> if you're watching, you we especially team. trust you, Megan. Yeah. I don't trust yeah. myself with the counting of boxes. Was more the no, I understand completely. I feel the same way. So. All right. So are we ready for a vote? I think so. Okay. I am looking for a motion to approve the 2018-2019 school year calendar as presented in the agenda materials. So moved. Uh, so a motion by John and a second. Second. By Nancy. Um, all in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? So that passes. Um, and okay. parents will be delighted we can start to circulate this. That is great. Um, yes. Okay. So we have now arrived at our second opportunity for public comment. We have two party people who waited it out for a long meeting, sorry about all the budget, so please feel free. You're right on schedule. Oh, that's a miracle. No, it's not. It's late, though. It's I'm sorry planned. about the lateness of the hour. You're like exactly on schedule. Well, this is amazing. I just had a couple of comments and questions. Sure, just, we're going to move the mic over, so, yep. and, um, and we just need your name, you know the drill. Sure. <laughs> uh, Al Stewart, 6 Oregon Road. Uh, so. My wife and I, we have uh, three children that uh, use the bus, and we do use Kidsboro, and it's three days a week, so I do like the um, what's been proposed. So I, I, I'm just curious, has, um, have each of the daycares kind of weighed in on this? Um, so we invited many of the daycares, well, we invited all the daycares that we contract with to the meeting that we had last week. Um, mm -hmm. so that they were able – have they weighed in on the current policy as discussed tonight? It was As it was discussed tonight? No. Oh, okay. I would just be curious. I, I mean, my kids go to Kidsboro, so yeah. I – and Kidsboro is 200 yards away from center school. Yeah. So it, it might change when, you know, the, the school is no longer uh, situated there. But yeah. I, I'm just curious how – that may or may not work out. So they were very much a part of our discussion, mm -hmm. um, and then I have been in contact just over, you know, texting with um, Chris, Christine. Oh, okay. Um, so she was aware of the changes that were happening tonight, but as far as reviewing the actual policy that the school committee had yet to take up, no. But okay. I think that's yeah, partly, that, and usually we're not, but yeah, we'll go back and forth at this yeah. point. It's, um, but, you know, I think that's also part of the reason why we're not going to vote tonight. We just want to give everybody a chance to yeah. see the updated, cleaned up version. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're not geniuses. There may be something that we haven't thought of that it still needs to be addressed. So, No, on, on paper, I, I think it's I think it's a very good idea. And uh, I didn't really think that my, my, myself I, either. Uh, just uh, as another point in terms of 
I know it was mentioned about the, the whole process, and I know it's been discussed many times. Uh, my son is in uh, fourth grade now, and I, I can remember when he was in kindergarten, we, we had this, this discussion as well. Um, I'm just in terms of getting it in front of the parents, you know, there may be a, a better way to do it. Uh, so the only way I found out was one of the parents happened to f see, you know, the change to the transportation policy. Um, so that was how I was informed. So it looked like to me as a parent that, oh, well, they're going to make this drastic change and they're not talking to us about it. So not knowing, you know, the process that was in place, um, mm. You know, so I remember when kindergarten was discussed full day, there used to be some coffee meetings over at Watercrest Farms. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking if there's things that we know are going to be, you know, touch points for a lot of parents, you know, maybe it's a good idea to get it out there prior to, you know, putting something on paper so that you can kind of get some of that input, you know, before. Mm -hmm. And again, that's just a way to, to, to fuse um, concern, anger, confusion, you know, with you know, with parents and, and the community, just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just an idea uh, to throw out there. So, yeah. and in terms of if you know uh, for the the fee, you know, why why was the fee removed uh, a few years ago to begin with? As I remember, when we first started, when my son was in kindergarten, maybe even first grade, we had the fee. Yes, it was passed on to uh, TLC, but at the time, TLC had twenty five kids getting on a bus so yes they were going to pass it on to us which was which was fine but then all of a sudden the fee disappeared mm -hmm. so i'm just curious why why that happened the bus feed, right? yeah and i think even before that so we we have a long history a lot a long and traumatic history with fees in this um district and they started you heard earlier the conversation with one of our selectmen about um when we were in a recession that's really when fees were put into place we had made a concerted effort after the economy started to turn around to reduce fees um, every year. We got to a point where we had done that consecutively for several years, and what bothered the, the school committee the most at that point was the inequity between for elementary kids living within two miles that they're paying bus fee, whereas kids outside of two miles are not paying a bus, bus fee. That's based on the law, but okay. it didn't feel equitable to us because – everybody needs to get to school we don't at, especially at the time it's better now didn't have a great system of sidewalks in mm -hmm. the town um and so a lot of reasons the daycare fee in particular we did put in um one year i think we had it possibly for two years and then it was reduced sort of as part of one part of that overall conversation around fees we don't like fees and sometimes they're a necessary evil because of budget constraints that mm -hmm. we're facing like we are this year um, but so um, and I, I they weren't generally popular <laughs> um, so we certainly got feedback. Well, no one we likes get, play we fees, get feedback at town yes. meeting um, to be honest with you quite frequently from the taxpayers who don't think there should be a bus fee of any type we still do have a <coughs> bus fee because again the law allows that um, and and that's more typical in other towns and it applies to every seventh through twelfth grader not dependent on where they live or the proximity to their school. So I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but that's sort of a, a short history. No, of our I, I was just curious because I, I know it was discussed about, you know, maybe instituting that again, but then you also made the point that the policy is separate from fees would right. be discussed as part of the budget, whereas, you know, the policy, but they are somewhat, you know, intertwined. So I was just curious, you know, um, how they originally came about and then how they they disappeared so yeah and we would never put a fee in a policy because then you have to change the policy if you want to change the fee so okay so even when we did have fees they were not in the policy they've been part of a procedure or you know, separate okay um certainly they're related <laughs> because of the topic but but they had never been in the policy got it understood okay yeah so i would just recommend that you know maybe it's good that you're, you're not voting on the policy per se at this point because I I'm just thinking that you know some of the daycare centers might want to weigh in on yep. you know how many buses they might expect because mm. I assume they are they have a set schedule they're expecting to get X kids off you know for whatever buses are showing up so if all of a sudden they went from two or three buses to ten buses you know showing up at you know beginning of the day and then you know um, 
you know, whatever time in the afternoon so those, those might be you know they, they might have some input on that so no, I'm sure so and, and I think mm -hmm. if we heard from but no I, I, I think it's they wouldn't have it's a, it's a great time. idea and thought from a, from a parent's perspective so okay. um, well, thank you for for following the process oh, and staying not, with us to problem. the better end <laughs> we appreciate <laughs> thank it. you I appreciate thank your time you. thanks very much um, are you interested in public comment Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we are at items by consensus. Is there anything that anyone wants to pull out to discuss separately? Okay, hit it. Goodness, I was missing my cue. <laughs> the superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. And I need a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay, a motion to Mr. Graziano, a second to Ms. Kavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Okay, so we do not have a need for executive session, correct? We do not. Okay, so we are ready to, I am excited to entertain a motion to adjourn at 1049. So moved. Ooh, good for you. Second? Second. All right. A motion by Jen and a second by Mina. Um, all in favor? Yes. Yes. And I won't even ask if there's anybody opposed. Okay. Um, so our next meeting is December 4th. We will be meeting in the middle school library starting at 5 p.m. We'll interview superintendent candidates at 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. December 6th in the middle school library at 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. We will have interviews and then we'll return to our next regular meeting which will be December 14th at 7 p.m. and I think that's it thank you as always to HCAM so thank the executive you. potential session was if you were going to be discussing salary range or anything like that but I think you'll do right that. I think we put it on as a placeholder but we don't need it